Cabal to the two of them. Display the option at one. आपको बाद में 
most important slide, I get this interstitial lung disease after six to seven to eight years seeing their primary care physicians who have been giving them antibiotics after antibiotics for pneumonia, diuretics after diuretics in cardiac workout for CHF. Why? Practice. Most of our physicians, including all of us in America, know only two causes of practice, static, infections, CSA. They never go to the third one for the physician lung disease. So that's why I wanted to present this. If they get missed, they die, or they need lung transplant. They are dry crackles, hear them as much as you can. They are totally different crackles than in home years. But I'm still surprised that even in America, I'm getting patients of years of diagnosis of pneumonia and CHF and sadly meet the doctors who will even to the extent of saying it's in the head of the patient and they will diagnose these patients with generalized anxiety disorders and PTSD rather than saying I am missing the disease. This is very, very sad. Next uh, slide. You can see 75% this is the survey of the patients. And I'm usually the third or the fourth physician who has been referred to as asthma COPD. At the moment I put the stethoscope right there, and then I know this is only fibrosis. It's sad to me when I see the track record. Now they're seeing me, lung function 40%, CT chest, honeycomb, needing oxygen. Very, very sad because of completely missing. Basically, just to tell you the terminal bronchiole and VOI, and there is a little curtain of loose connective tissue, which the, whoever you believe is made of, and put between inside the VOI and inside blood vessel. Because there's a small blood vessel that surrounds each distal airway in the VOI. These diseases, for whatever reason, choose that portion of the whole lung. Deep airways alone, everything alone, go right to the incision. And that's why these people are extremely short of breath. They desaturate by walking a few steps. They have crackles and they are getting worse by the day. Next. So, a good history, and next slide, a good history should be taken because now you want to look for reasons for the ILP that you have picked up. So, look at their history. Nearly every disease and the drugs we give for the disease can cause ILP. Think about it. Gastric diseases, cardiac diseases, even, even sleep apnea. Anything that the patient has can play a role in IOD or their treatment can. Next slide. There is a litany of medications, the number is very high, that can work IOD. So look at the list of the patients. Chemotherapy given 10 years ago can work IOD now. In your drone, very common cause. Women with the recurrent GI nitroferrin point, very common cause. Autoimmune disease and therapy, very common cause. Marriage disease therapy, very common cause. You've got to look for a cause of this IV before you say this is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Next, ask them the exposures. There are many ILDs, including the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and several more, related to smoking. So they have combined COPD and eczema and that interstitial lung disease. So that's what they do the worst. Upper lungs are gone from emphysema, lower lungs are gone from pulmonary fibrosis. So they are in trouble and they have missed for years. Tobacco I said, drugs, many street drugs, and then occupation, any occupation and every occupation, you want to hear things. It can cause ILD, whether it's been published or not. Environment, anything. Avocation of hobby, anything. Travel to areas. So you've got to look into all that. Next slide. Familial. Many ILDs have a very strong familial component. So he says, my mother had pulmonary fibrosis or sarcoidosis or rheumatoid lung. Now she was looking at this patient. Very high chance. He has similar or close to similar disease as uh, the family member. Next, 
start examining them. If you hear primarily wheezing, wrong cries, squeaks, sparks, inspiration, and initial inspiration, if you hear crackles, upper lungs, you are hearing abnormal sounds, so that's not reality. Though, there are a few obstructive ideas where you can have these findings, but inevitably, mid to late inspiration, lower lungs, dry, coarse crackles that refuse to go away. It baffles me that physicians are making the same diagnosis for six to eight years. Rather than saying the same crackle I put six years ago, I have been hearing all through how can it be CHF and pneumonia? And those crackles are at the same area in the lungs as they were six years ago. But you will be surprised. They don't go to the third cause of crackles. Next. Once you hear bipedal crackles, train your mind. They are so classic crackles that every time I get patients with asthma, COPD, I put my stethoscope to the pelvis level and start coming up to listen. These doctors never go below the scapula. You start from here and right there you will hear these crackles. Listen to them as many times as you want. Make them walk around, cough around, somersault, whatever you do. Same crackle, same position, and they are like Velcro. Open the Velcro of the BP apparatus. Listen to that sound. That is that. So once you have heard it, you know it right away. That this poor soul that you treated for asthma, COPD, CHF, pneumonia, and sadly. It was nothing but pulmonary fibrosis every time. Next. So, keep these in mind. Exertional dyspnea going on for a while. Dry cough for a while. Achieve some family history. Abnormal chest, whatever the abnormality may be. They make them walk. If they walk from here to those microphones, they will drop their sacks by six, eight, nine, ten points. No other disease will ever do that. You so will do that. Quick spirometry or PFT prescription. And then you can immediately look at their, uh, their uh, crackles, I said, maybe. So you can add to this list of a few may have, and positive autoimmune serologies if you happen to do that. Next. This is uh, the loops you will see. We all know the obstructive loop. The total number packs in all or high and flows uh, less than expected over the entire volume range. Little bit, forever taking to empty the lungs. There is your emphysema surely. In the middle is restriction, which is had, we call it. Very high flows, very fast, lung is emptied in a second. If your which is had. And that is restriction. Ratio will be normal or high. FEV1 will be high. That's everything will be normal. Next will be mixed, and you can see the initial part of expiration will be restricted, boom, and then taking forever because the obstruction kicks in during the downward portion, you know, right away. If you are an astute clinician, you can make diagnosis of patients' diseases just by looking at this. Next one. Every patient with interstitial lung disease must have a serological test. Basic blood test, CBC, metabolic panels, all of them will have normal. But everyone should have a whole panel of serologies, hypersensitive pneumonitis panel, sarcoid, angiogenes, and pneumonitis panel. So I have made a panel of 10 tests that then I just sign and I send the patient for. But any time you suspect a lot of lung disease, the patient must be reported to. Rheumatology next. This is a very important slide for all of you to take home. A patient with only three weeks of history comes with just some sputum, uh, clear sputum and some sinus congestion. That's it. Thank God, chest x-ray was done. What does it show? Some minimal basal lung reticulation. Thank God, radiologist mentioned that. And thank God, the urgent care or the ER or whichever physician was said, Whoa, I must go to the next step. First, thank God he ordered the x ray. Second, thank God he read the report. Third, he ordered the test that should have been. And 
what you are seeing is 10 to 20 times worse findings than a chest x-ray. I have known colleagues who have never ordered a chest x-ray. So, uh, next slide. This is what you see in my process. Reticulation, fracture, bronchial disease, I hope. This pattern is called UIP, usual interstitial pneumonitis. This is what you want to see. Next. Next slide. Bronco, as you know, the large or transbronchial biopsies we do, if we still haven't reached the diagnosis of HRCT, you still don't know what's going on. And then, and then you go and do a large and biopsies, and we now do in life endobronchial ultrasound guided transbronchial needle aspiration of the nose. You can see the aorta and pulmonary artery pumping and you pick the nose right between them and you literally are passing live needle between those blood vessels into the lymph node and then you can do endobronchial transbronchial and if you have a terrific public pathologist like my wife, that's all she does for her pathology they will be able to pick up diagnosis even from those small fragments. Next slide. Finally, if you don't have an answer, even after bronchoscopy, think about putting that patient for surgical biopsy. What am I going to do with findings? Am I going to change in major way? And is it going to help me to send him to transplant? Can he undergo surgery? The majority of these patients are old, they have multiple comorbidity, they have oxygen, and there is plenty of data to show now when you do surgical and biopsy in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, it gets worse and the die. The last time I sent no patient for surgical and biopsy was 10 years ago, because we have learned over years how to diagnose every ILD on the whole history exam and CT scan. We are very confident of what we're doing. Next. Just a quick thing, just to the precise idea, this is how IPF looks. Mm -hmm. uh, X-ray, as we have shown earlier, will show minimal findings. Do not get fooled by the X-ray. I tell my medical students there, nothing normal means there is no disease. No symptom doesn't mean no disease. Keep that in your head. If you think there is a disease, you go all the way. And you go all the way, you will see 20 times more findings on CT than chest X-ray. I don't even order an X-ray when I get practice. Directly at your CT. You are seeing all those patterns of UIP. It starts from bottom, you still don't know the cause, subtly climbs up and suffocates you to death. I have patients who have died with this disease on a ventilator. 30 centimeter peak, 100% uh, oxygen. Okay. So it's a, it's a wall. That curtain has become a wall. Next. Just like you have acute exacerbations of asthma and COPD, you have acute exacerbation of IPL. All of a sudden, for unexplained reasons, symptoms are worse, PFT is worse, CT is worse, and CT has new bilateral radiographic and your interface. And you have ruled up on this. 85% mortality of this. If there are older people who come with this, we don't intubate them. We tell the family, this person should not be intubated. Manage the bypass level and let it be because of very, very high mortality. Next. The teaching now is the day you suspect IPF in the patient is the day you start treatment. If you tell him I see you three months, six months later, he may either be dead because of the good exacerbation, or he will walk in your office three to six months later with oxygen and a whole person disease because of death. And that is why the day you suspect it, Keep ordering your tests, start antifibrotic therapy. And thank God it is in 2015, zero. Every patient may be dying or have lung transplant. We have two over tablets. Next.
Just look like hypersensitive pneumonitis, birds, mold, thermophilic bacteria, chemicals. I just saw a patient who went three times to the hospital, very big hospital in my town, very big hospital. Every three, every time he went in those six months, he received treatment for this CT picture as pneumonia. He got antibiotics, he gets IV steroids, he gets better. Goes home, crash it. Crack. In diagnosis. Then I asked somebody referring to me. My only question was when I saw this, do you have birds at home? Yes, sir. I have 300 patients at home. So every time he was going home, he was having an acute hypersensitivity attack. In the hospital, he got better not by antibiotics, but being away from pigeons and steroids. Told him to get the, uh, uh, all those 300 pigeons to his enemy. And then put him on about three months of prednisone paper, completely cleared up. Otherwise, next slide, this is where he would have been. A very, very close Indian friend of ours who lives in Charlotte is a big philanthropist. He's made the local temple in Charlotte and has given truckloads of money to seniors and everybody. Had a parrot at home. And the parrot gave him this disease. I tried to, we all tried our best to keep him alive. This disease unfortunately reaches a point where even after removing the source, it will not go away. And that was his, he succumbed to this disease. A very, very close friend died from a parrot. Next. Last is autoimmune disease. They will show non specific interstitial arthritis, which is not a ground glass passage, it's some regulation fraction, and there's not pretty really good to stay at that junction. Uh, or they go into the next phase, you might be. So you see these two are not immune. Third, you see many times, or triplogenic organized pneumonia, you will see. You will see pleural disease in them. You will see aspiration in them because the metamycitis is slurred or not. Yeah. Bachelor's is something as weak muscles and aspiration. So those are what you will see in this. Last slide is the next slide. And just a quick case, she comes to me as Raynaud Sinamayan, African-American or semi-African-American, because in India, in the US, there are a lot of semi-hybrids. And uh, do the serology, AMA just tells me the non-homeopathy process going on. The SCL70 topoisomerase tells you which is systemic sclerosis. Do the spirometry, primary restriction, low FEC, low TLC, low DLCO, normal to high FEV1, normal to high ratio. Last thing you immediately do, high RCT. She's got everything. She's got reticulation, ground glass, honeycomb, and traction on the FSS. Thank you. So just to make you all aware, there is a third cause of crackles or respiratory symptoms. And that third cause, unfortunately, may kill the patient faster than the other two causes that we have been treating, infections and CHF. This disease which we miss which is always missed, unfortunately takes them down for the other two reasons that the patient can receive treatment for. Anytime you have a patient of any disease, as a, as a 45 year old doctor, anytime a patient comes back to you six months later with whatever disease it is, whatever, he's not better, you have to Rethink rather than saying there's something wrong with him. If you are sure he's complying with therapy, then you've got to look at your diagnosis. If he's not better at all, otherwise you will continue the same cycle and you will hurt the patient very badly over the years. Thank you.
here at Bristol Medical College and Hospital in Tana. Thank you all for joining in. We will now start with the inauguration ceremony for today's event. We have with us our chief guest, Dr. Kalindi Williams, the Dow Medical Council member who has taken our time from his busy schedule to grace this occasion. Thank you very much, sir.
the name of the Lord is strong tower, the light is running into it and are safe. And in their mind acquires knowledge, and the ear of those who are wise seeks knowledge. A gift opens doors, it gives access to the good, great. A gift opens doors, it gives access to the great. Will the great. This new day is the gift of God. So this is seeing in the fullness is the gift of God. And this gift is going to open a door of knowledge and wisdom to every one of us. Holy Gracious Father, thank you Lord for this beautiful morning. Thank you for bringing all of us together in your presence. And especially Lord, we are so thankful for every moment that you provide us to get your knowledge and wisdom. And above all, Lord, to spread that knowledge and wisdom among the people. And Lord, with that mission, you have kept us as the beacon of your hope and of your wisdom. And Lord, we are so thankful for Christian Medical College and Hospital of Ghana. And especially our big well of alumni who are spread all over the world. And today, when they are here, along with all the other dignitaries, Lord, we give today CME in your hands the fruits. We are so thankful for our chief guest, all our administrators, all the alumni who have joined from different places, and above all those, our own community members. But together, when we learn the new things, let this workshop be a blessing. We give all our resource people in your hands. Thank you for the knowledge that you have given them. Today when they spread it, so that it be a blessing and future resource for all of us. In our holy and precious name, we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now we have the lighting of the lamp. I would request our chief guest, Dr. Karanthi Golan, our director, Dr. Vivian Bhatti, principal, Dr. Jairaj Pandey, medical superintendent, Dr. Alice Golan, uh, principal, Delhi College, Dr. A.P. Thomas, principal, College of Physiotherapy, Dr. Sandhi, and the alumni members, President, Dr. Ajay Kumar, Vice President, Dr. Kavita Bhatti, and Secretary, Dr. Karaj. Please come forward to light and
guests of today, Dr. William Murphy, Director of CDC, Dr. Jaira Chumani, Principal, Dr. Aaron Jaira, Director of CDC, Dr. Henry Thomas, Dr. Sandeep, Principal of the College and Dr. Jaira Chumani. Delegates from all over the world, alumni of CDC, faculty, students, and dear friends. Good morning, everyone. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all for the CME Rumors 2024. As you all know, the speakers in this CME are eminent faculty who have graduated from CMC Lujana and achieved expertise in various medical and surgical fields. The name Rumors is the name of a tree which was artificially created through the process of drafting. Also known as the tree of 40 fruits, it is a single tree that those 40 different types of stone fruits including peaches, plums, apricots, nectarines, cherries and almonds. Fishermetal College of Dhanna, our almometer, is that fruitful tree which has nurtured all of us since we were sown in the soil of CMCI samples and have continued to grow till now when we ourselves have become fruit eating trees. Our speakers in today's CMC will exhibit the variety of taste, color and aroma of all the different groups of CMC Lutyana. The logo for the CME is tree. It represents the tree of CMC being multiple groups of different size, shape, and color. Rumors 2024 serves as a testament to the enduring legacy of CMC Lutyana and the remarkable achievements of its alumni. It is a platform for us to come together, celebrate our shared journey and exchange knowledge and experiences for the betterment of healthcare. I hope you all will relish the academic feast which is going to be laid before you do this evening. I thank you all for your presence, which has made this evening a successful one. Thank you. Organizing this alumni meeting uh, 
uh, every year two batches coming together uh, and uh, hosting the alma mater, looking at the memories, refreshing all the old memories, uh, establishing new connections. And, uh, but recently I was in uh, Los Angeles, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Paul, uh, she organized a small uh, scene to look at that and get together. There were a lot of people supposed to come and unfortunately there was a, a very strange storm uh, and uh, many people could not come from far places from California. But the people who were there, it was one of the junior most alumni who just joined the residency in LA, one of the very prestigious hospital. Uh, and what he mentioned was uh, his clinical skills. Uh, his boss uh, appreciated and told, you know, yeah, everybody looks at the scans and make diagnosis, but uh, 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 this person was able to make a typical diagnosis without any scan. So if you look at uh, the chain that is uh, imparted to the students here, it's amazing. And I have been a request not only within the country, but also overseas, and I meet people who uh, and I give myself a uh, also from this institution. And, um, uh, it's great, and uh, that's because not only really does the textbook knowledge, the clinical script, but also the theories like this. Um, theories like this uh, you know, gives a way of exposure to the medical student. Particularly with the new curriculum, you know, all these activities are in um, like electives, etc. There is no interaction. And, uh, and this theory is, uh, is very unique. Last year they introduced the synchronous. Uh, it's a global international theory and uh, uh, I'm very confident that all of us will benefit, but some of us have to leave uh, because of the congregation and all that all the arrangements that we have to make. So on behalf of the American College, my best wishes for all of you. Thank you.
improve the outcomes of healthcare in Brown. And as always, I have always been a fan of CNC, and you all know my director of CNC, uh, Smita was a friend of CNC, and she has served him for 225 years. And our first love has always been CNC, and will remain my future also. Uh, not standing between you and the next program, which you are very successful and highly uh, appreciable uh, CME as well as get together and as already declared announced three guidelines from CMC and uh, from Ujamika Council. And Ujamika Council is always keeping CMC at the top in the academic activities. And I'm not saying for the sake of saying over here that I'm standing before you. And we generally have meetings and discussions uh, in our medical council, and I always praise our activities of CMC in the only private medical college which is really connected to the advancements and uh, academics in the medical field. Thank you once again, thank you once again for the all the honor I have from you. Thank you. We are so pleased to have all of you here at CMC to celebrate the Founders Day and the Bachelor Day. It's always a joy and pleasure to come back to our own institution. Before we continue with the CMA, we have a small word of thanks by Dr. Paul Sula.
practicing in Mahayana and uh, today we will be talking all about evolution of neonatology. Over to Dr. Yeah. 
of cardboard or wooden boxes and then in the glass we could see that. But from this, the next slide. They used to think, I'm, I'm sure this is not very clear, we used to think that keeping the babies cold could improve their survival. A milestone study, this happened very late. Remember this study is 1960. We came to know that keeping babies warm helped. Yes, please. Almost a difference of 2.5 million rupees in this country. It has everything that the baby needs from above the road temperature, humidity, oxygen, wings, scale, noise, control, moisture, and monitor. You, you can do anything with this. So, this is a thing that neurotology has been witnessed in the last six decades. And most units, the smallest one of them, would be cared for in these incubators than, than obviously. Anything else? Next, next slide. Looking at the transport of these babies, I, I still remember when I in my MD, people used to say India may transport kaise kare. Yeah, we were told the best way to do that is thermocol boxes. I don't know if we have people from that in other things. I, I can only see Dr. Bart here. And they said that is the best way to transport, and that was talked of even in, in conferences, that how to keep the baby warm during transport, and that that is somewhere, something that we used to do maybe around five decades ago. This is the, the if I may call that, the, the initial transport incubators. And what we have got now, next. This is the current transport incubator, which will cost even more than the one that I showed previously. You can, you can put the baby on high frequency oscillation, you can give it head like a during transport. You can take this incubator onto the helicopter, you can just push it into an ambulance. So that is the change that we have seen. And this change, we have seen in India in the last maybe two decades, not, not more than that. I did my MD in 1999, so 25 years uh, from almost exactly to the date I did my MD. And at that time, still, what the recommendation was, there was no transport incubator as I know it at that time. Was thermocol boxes for transporting this baby or keep the baby with the mother. Next. Respiratory support. The only thing before 1961 is the baby has any respiratory system, just give them oxygen. The principle was if little and good, a lot should be better. So give them restricted oxygen. And there we learned a lot that oxygen is a drug. The most commonly used drug in neonatal ICU and should be used judiciously. It led to an epidemic of disease, what we used to know as the retroventral fibroplasia, currently called retroventral immaturity. 1960s saw a surge in research for respiratory support for newborns, principally because one of the big girls died. That is the irony. Unless that happens, no one funds it. Kennedy's son died of so-called hybrid membrane disease and that pumped money into research on neurology. Initial and, and I don't know whether someone will remember the Asher regime. This was something like giving glucose and bicarbonate to baby with respiratory distance syndrome could improve their outcome. That would be hardly used by carbonate. They just found out that maybe some babies had metabolic acid, so that, that improved and the baby survived. But from there on, the death slide. 1971, a breakthrough year, CPAP. Today is the, is the cornerstone of respiratory therapy for the ones we want away from here to ventilation. But in, around 50 years ago, we, we started that. That's something that here has talked to the adult population also. Next. 
Entertainment speakers change the course the way we look at this. It's a syndrome, uh, a study done in sheep for something different, for preventing fetal labor led to discovery of steroids, increasing survival of very small babies. Survival of respiratory distress also increased. Surfactant so 1980s, monitoring babies 1990s. So, these are the changes that we've seen over the years, and this is led to improving survival. Now, we come to survival. 1993, I decided to become a neurologist. Uh, must have been Professor Chepal. That was uh, something to see her taking care of babies. For my dad, I'm more known for leading every medicine in PGI, for pediatrics in Patiala, than anything else. That love affair started in 1993, it continues to date. That's where the calling is. That's where the calling is. Next. Assisted ventilation for some reason started before the CPAP, 1960s, but we came to go very early as, as the neurologist knew. Assisted ventilation is not the way to go. That would cause two major problems. Is what initially was known as bronchopulmonary dysplasia, currently known as chronic lung disease. The baby would be ventilated and then continue to be an oxygen die of it. Can't do anything. Or they get developed air release, more likely a PIE, pulmonary interstitial emphysema and then leading to complications. So, although we have ventilators as far as uh, ago in the 1960s also, but they were not really doing their job properly. So what has changed? Next. Change in this form. Today we have high frequency ventilation and perhaps that is everyone would know. But remember what volume ventilation has come only in this century for the world. And to just get an idea of what volume ventilation means, ventilating a 400 gram baby with 4 ml per kg means delivering just 1.5 ml tidal volume to these babies consistently. That is where the technology has reached. Uh, volume ventilation has been there for a dust, right? So, 500 ml is different than 1.5 ml. Measuring that much volumes. Yes, we are doing it today. Inhaled nitrate came as, came as, as, as one of the things that, that we use very frequently in inhaled nitrate and then pulmonary graphics to help us. Not necessarily, I don't know how much, but definitely it looks very nice on the ventilator to see those pulmonary graphics. They can help us occasionally to really make some changes. Next. Cardio condition. I, I, I put up this slide just to make people realize that before the, the PDA surgical closure, it was believed that we both don't fear pain, don't feel pain. Then one fine day, they allowed a the parent to look through the glass window. Their baby being operated for PDA. And he actually filed a lawsuit. To say, yes, I can see that my baby is struggling, and you need to do it. That was the beginning of treating pain in newborns. The first PDA surgery, the PDA surgery used to be done without any anesthesia also today. And today, even if intra-implant surgery is done, it is still done under anesthesia for the fetus. Next. Nutrition, it has been a full circle. Starting from breastfeed, which we all knew was there, and that is it. To, to, to going on to TPN, the total parental nutrition, which was in vogue 1990s and 2000s, to coming back to full enteral nutrition for very small babies. This is the hot topic in neurology. They do small babies, if you just feel that from day one, would they tolerate it? Answer is most of them yes. Most of them yes. Beyond 28 weeks and more, most babies do tolerate full enteral nutrition. This has been a full circle, a loving circle for, for the neurologists. That just don't start them. There was an era when starvation was thought to be better for these babies. Today, even a 100 calorie loss in the first week could make the difference for those 5 by 3 points for the baby. So that is where we have gone in, in terms of research. Perhaps neurology was the first subject which uh, we 
which led to so many meta-analysis and the Cochrane group of neurology was the most active of the groups initially. You really shut out research because there was hardly anything that was available. Now I, I, I know that more, very meta we know the word meta-analysis very well today, but, but 20 years ago, perhaps the only research group which was doing such things as meta-analysis was the neurology group. Next. Just last slide on survival. Next. Definition of viability. My dad, who did his MBBS, I think, in the year 1970, used to say 8 kilos in each of the survival in And they delivered a viability of 28 degrees, and he would say, we have time to say, let's leave them. And I tell my dad, then I would be out of the job today. My only job is taking care of small movies. Most places around the world would have 24 weeks as, as a cutoff for viability. Many, many centers would do 22 weeks also. And at 24 weeks, the median survival is around 50%. 50%. And that has gone down from 29 weeks where the survival is 50% to 24 weeks where the survival is 50%. We provide the same results. 1960, the survival was 5%. Today, the year of the survival is 95%. I don't think many other specialties have seen this, this cross change which neurology has seen. Next. And we have learned, as I said, we have learned from errors. And these are some of the errors using sulfonamides in newborns, the breakfast, using chlorophyll cross, radiology syndrome, gastroscopy, if you use use in real with everybody's this modality, and we we have learned from these mistakes as we went down, and yes, now we know perhaps to some extent what needs to be done, but there are many more goals to achieve. Next. The future. I, I, I would not have imagined 20 years ago that I would be talking about gene therapy today, but today, every year we add more diseases than we treated by gene therapy. We started with SMA, now we have many more which can be treated. Yesterday I talked to the patient on SME on, on the need for the therapy. Obviously, it's, it's prohibitively costly in India. I don't know whether they found it in the US or not, but here it costs. Some of the people have got it by crowdfunding. Artificial placenta is the next thing. They're the only way we can go down on the babies. Uh, the, the threshold for survival would be having an artificial placenta. Perhaps on the cards, now nothing seems impossible. Maybe another 20 years down the line, we would be looking at babies the way we used to look at in 1950s, through the glass walls, a baby growing, right from conception down to giving the baby away to the parents. Next. Yes, newer vaccines are on the horizon, but new things on the, on the vaccine front is giving vaccines to moms only. So I'm, 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 I end up teasing moms there's nothing for the dads as yet. So moms would actually get the vaccines for their babies also. They are already getting the treatments. Something which I don't think nature is going to change is that moms delivering babies and then getting the vaccination in due, uh, during pregnancy for their babies also. Next. Blood substitutes on the cards. Next. Next. Final slide. Stem cell therapy, we all know, for any damages to the organs, we could, we could just order the organ and get the organ if we've damaged it. Be it brain or be it heart or be it kidneys. Thank you. This is the smallest that we have saved. Two of the triplets, 410 grams, 24 weeks. Yes, uh, we provide the same level of care in this country as, as, as anywhere at much lesser rates. I can assure one day's cost of near it lies you in US cost somewhere around rupees five lakhs. Uh, we just take maybe three days of stay in near it lies you in US is equal to discharging a 24 weeks baby in, in this country. Thank you. I hope I've not exceeded the time. Anything, any comments or questions?
Yeah, yeah. What I was thinking to myself, do you remember the practice of the Holy Spirit? I've seen thousands of patients that have treated all kinds of diseases, haven't cured a single one, have controlled the diseases by the practice of the Holy Spirit, or the other name and diseases, there's no cure. Different values of the disease, not just in spiritual aspects. Um, but we, it, it doesn't mean it's not so, but our thinking is the only way. But now we know the answer. We now have evidence, information, of about 2,600 diseases that we all take in our patients. What are their genetic variations? We are born with. We have pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Rachna would be able to talk about that. So we... we, we I think Rachna was going to make a comment. I think uh, Dr. Sandhya is talking about genomics, and uh, I, I'll leave those comments to Sandhya on that only. There, there is a lot of ethical issues involved with, with uh, what Sir has said, and uh, perhaps we need to find an answer to those ethical issues before we just embark upon that journey. That journey could start today, but yes, we need, we need them.
that happened in the neonatal period that actually change your eventual outcome. So I look forward to listening to you Precisely. about genes. Uh, there is more to genes I, I think it's not the, only the neonatal, it's the fetal origin of adult diseases, the Barker's hypothesis. Uh, and and uh, the effect of environment and, and programming of genes, which environment can do, and uh, uh, we don't want to take away Sandhya's lecture here. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ashwini, for a, a great talk. Now we move on to the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Jubin Jaganjekar from the batch of 1990. <laughs> Dr. Jubin has done uh, MBBS from Christian Medical College, Ludhiana. And after that, he went on to do his MD medicine and then he did his DNB endocrinology. He's currently the professor and head on sabbatical leave from uh, uh, Department of Endocrinology, Christian Medical College, Ludhiana. And at present, he is working as consultant endocrinologist in Naseem Medical Center, Doha. Uh, today, he will be talking on dietary management of obesity. Thanks, Prabhu. I, have, I, I did a small exercise. How many of you believe obesity is a disease? How many of you believe obesity is a consequence of bad lifestyle, so you are at fault for it? A lot of you believe that obesity is a poor lifestyle choice, and uh, you are at blame for it. Okay, so I'll, uh, I did a bit of calculation. I think in this room, everybody for the last 20 years has had 300 more calories than what they require in a day. Every day, most of us eat about 300 to 600 calories, more than what we require to run our bodies. So, how do I switch? So I did some uh, simple mathematics. I am from the batch of 1990 and all my classmates are here. I'm sure each of them have consumed 300 extra calories since they passed out here in 1995. Some of us left in 1996 because we took some more time to pass. So I'll, I'll explain myself. My weight when I left this college was 52. Every day since then I've eaten 300 ca extra calories. I can remember one or two days that I eight less calories. One time I was caught in a train in a flood and I had no food for 24 hours. That day I ate less calories, but otherwise on an average I've eaten 300 extra calories every day. And simple math says that that 9,000 calories should add up to about one kg every month. That's the simple maths where if each of us believes that it's a lifestyle disease. So that means every year since the time I passed out, I should have gained 12 kilos. And that means today, 20 years, uh, years since I've passed out, my expected weight should have been about 332 kilos. And I'm, most of my classmates, I'm sure they eat more than me. They have taken 600 calories extra. We should have all been 330 to 500 kilos. But fortunately, I am still 62, 322 kgs less than what I expected. Now, people will ask, why did this happen? If it was simple mathematics, just calorie in, calorie out, we should have all been about, I think the batch of 1990 should have been about 400 kilos on an average, batch 74, maybe about 1,000 kilos. Our doors are very wide uh, in the assembly hall, but we are not. And that is single uh, important reason is insulin resistance. We tend to blame insulin resistance for all the bad things. But insulin resistance is also the reason why we are not 300, 400 kilos. All of us humans are, as we get heavier, it becomes more difficult to put on more weight. That is because of the insulin resistance. That is why when we lose weight, we tend to gain back the weight and come back to the same place very quickly because nobody is going to stop that 300 extra calories. So that is my talk today. How can we reduce that 300 extra calories? That's the only way 
we can address obesity. Now, some people might say physical activity might be a uh, way to lose weight, but I can tell you, you have to put in a lot of physical exercise if you want to burn the 300, 600 calories that you eat in excess. So, obesity can only be addressed by diet. And there are many reasons why, I mean, all of us eat the same extra 300 calories. Someone is at 70, someone is at 100, someone is, I am at 62. Those reasons is how we burn the fat or how we utilize the fat. And the reasons are genetic. The reasons may be in neonatology, maybe the gut bacteria that we inherit from our mothers is the way we, uh, uh, we dispose of calories. So many reasons. This is a secure model, and uh, this secure model was devised in India only by, by some of my colleagues. And what we do when, now I have changed my thinking about obesity. We used to think of BMI as a marker for obesity. We don't. Now it is entirely up to somebody with a BMI of 25 comes to me for weight loss drug. I would still prescribe them the weight loss drugs because it is not the weight that matters. It is what they think of the weight. Obviously, I'll make sure they don't have an eating disorder. But after that, if somebody with a BMI of 25 wants weight loss therapy, wants to do something about the weight, I'm very happy to help them. So obesity no longer we consider in terms of BMI. We consider in terms of what it does to you. Obviously, you have uh, medical problems ranging from diabetes, hypertension, lipids, but also psychological problem. A BMI of 25 in a young girl might cause us so much distress that she may be suicidal. So I don't think we consider that. And then obviously a lot of functional problems as well, difficulty in climbing stairs, knees, back. So I wanted to talk about diet. Now this is something that I kept kept uh, getting asked because depending on, I mean, we have quite a few lifestyle doctors in our class. Each of them has a new diet. Today, uh, doc, doc, where is Donald? Donald told me about his SSRI diet. So as many doc, functional doctors are there, there's many different types of diets are there. So you have to figure out which is the best diet. So this is a review I did on that topic. And if you look at uh, the outline that I have, the broad principles are very same. The broad principles of all kinds of diet is either you restrict calories or you restrict a macronutrient. So you get rid of a macronutrient or you restrict calories. How you do it is up to you. When you have calorie restriction, you could have what we call intermittent calorie restriction. You eat what you want for some time, then you don't eat. Or you could be much more disciplined and you could have what we call a daily calorie restriction. That means you eat less. Uh, when you are removing macronutrients, you can remove only two macronutrients. You can't like, really remove your proteins. If you remo uh, remove your proteins, you're going to also lose your muscle mass. So the only two macronutrients we can safely remove to some extent is fat and carbs. So we have low fat diets and we have low carb diets. How do we choose which diet? Many of you need to be on diet. So how do you choose which diet is good for you? I think it depends on some characteristics. Is there any difference between the macronutrient uh, deficit, I mean, stopping the macronutrient or calorie restriction? But I think what is very clear in all the studies is all the macronutrient diet also, the benefits come from the, uh, from the decrease in calories. So that means if you remove fat, you've also removed a large amount of calories and your benefits are coming from that, not from the removal of the fat in itself. So how do you decide? So this is a, a checklist that we have in the OPD. So how do you decide you want to go on a macronutrient uh, deficient diet or do you want to go on a calorie restricted diet? So there, there are some phenotypes that I use. If you are a person with good self-control, anybody who's got good self-control for food can go on a calorie restriction diet. If you don't have good self-control, it's good to, you are not able to resist food, then you go on to a macronutrient deficient diet, either a low fat or a low carb diet. First timers are usually more motivated. And if you're first time trying out something, calorie restriction is good. But uh, most people will fail calorie restriction and then they'll try out these macronutrient diets, low carb, Atkins and other diets. Motivated, not motivated. For motivated people, calorie restriction is better. For non-motivated people, macronutrient deficiency is better. Now this uh, 
binge eaters, and uh, for all of them, macronutrient uh, is much better. Now, once you have decided you are going on a calorie-restricted diet, how do you decide whether you want to do intermittent fasting or you want to do time-restricted eating? People confuse the two terms. Intermittent fasting is actually when you fast for certain days of the week, while time-restricted eating is when you restrict yourself to not eating for a certain period of time in the day itself. So there are three types of calorie restrictions that you can do. You can do a continuous energy restriction where you eat less food. You can do intermittent fasting where you fast on certain days or you can do time-restricted eating where you don't eat in for a certain period of time during the day. Which of these is better? Again, the answer is all of them work the same. It really doesn't matter if you restrict calories, you are going to lose weight. Whether you do intermittent fasting, whether you do time-restricted eating, it does not really matter. What matters is if you are reducing the amount of calories, that 300 extra calories that you are eating, you are reducing it, plus losing another 300 calories, you will lose weight. Uh, these, these, these are some uh, papers if you want the science, but I'm, I'm sure you don't want the science. I'm just going to tell you that both of them are the same. But how to decide? Now, some of you want to decide whether you want to go on a, uh, a continuous energy restriction or you want to go on an intermittent en energy restriction. So again, the comorbid phenotype decides that if you have somebody with diabetes, advanced diabetes, heart disease, kidney disease, you are not going to advise them intermittent fasting. We saw some papers coming out with increased strokes, increased uh, complications with intermittent fasting. So people with a lot of problems, medical problems, it's better to advise them continuous calorie restriction. While if you are healthy and you want to lose weight, then intermittent fasting may be an option. Uh, yeah, it's an option to prevent and also an option now for reversal of diabetes. Now, intermittent fasting is extremely good for those who have access to food all the time. Like if you're working from home, there's always food around. So you're always tempted to eat. On Fridays, I'm not working. I'm always, for some reason, always hungry. This, on Thursdays, I'm working two shifts. And I don't feel hungry. I mean, even if I feel hungry, I have no access to food. So intermittent fasting is uh, good for people who have continuous access to food, while uh, total calorie restriction is much better those who have limited access to food. And there are grazers and binge eaters, those who uh, stay hungry for a longer time and then they eat a lot for them. Uh, the continuous calorie restriction is better. Now, I'll not uh, talk about how can we go about. Now, if you want to do continuous energy restriction, there is a certain threshold beyond. else or you'll have partial meal where two meals will be shakes and powders and one meal will be uh, a normal meal but anything less than thousand calories it's otherwise impossible to maintain on except Lydia can maintain I think thousand calories with normal food uh, yeah so that's just to show you now we come to the other part where we try and uh, reduce macronutrients we have two choices whether we should reduce fat or whether we should uh, reduce carbs how many of you will go for a low-fat diet? Well, everyone wants carbs now. How many of you will go for a low-carb diet? Ah, everyone likes low-carb diets. So I think uh, the whole answer, it does not really matter. All of them will lead to the same kind of weight loss, but low-fat diets are more difficult to, uh, to continue with. The attrition rate is much higher with low-fat diets, much easier to maintain a low-carb diet than a low-fat diet. So how to decide? Obviously, if you have diabetes, a low-carb diet is more beneficial than a low-fat diet. If you have uh, postprandial uh, hyperglycemia, it's more beneficial to be on a low-carb diet. While if you're on an SGLT2 inhibitor, you're ketosis-prone for some reason, it's not a good idea to stop the carbs completely. 
uh, those who are hungry all the time for the because carbs are something that once you consume carbs a certain time later you feel hungry again it's exactly exactly about two hours later you will feel hungry again that's uh, so those who are hungry all the time it's always uh, good for them to go on a low carb diet that will also reduce their hunger while those who are poor eaters it's good to go for a uh, low fat diet Finally, I think all advice needs to be patient-centric. You have so many variables you have to consider before you tell the patient what diet he needs to go. You can uh, give them fancy names, you, but the principles are the same. Either you have to restrict calories or you have to get rid of one uh, macronutrient, either fat or uh, carbohydrate. I'll not talk about this, but I think what I want to tell you is those who don't consider obesity as a disease, please consider obesity as a disease. The primary way to go about it is to reduce the calories. Either way, how you reduce this, it's completely up to you. But remember, now there are good drugs, and a friendly endocrinologist is always willing to prescribe them. Unfortunately, these drugs are not available in India. Currently, the, none of the effective drugs are available in India, so that is why my next slide is, if any of you want to lose weight with pharmacological method, come to Doha. <laughs> I have two options here. I have a basic option for those uh, with lower incomes and a premium option as well. The basic option, you, the <laughs> tickets are very cheap. To Doha from uh, Delhi or Cochin, it's only 24,000 on Indigo. So that's the cost of the tickets. I'll book you one night hotel stay. It's not very expensive. This is uh, right next to my uh, clinic. Food and Uber will cost about 10,000 bucks. My consultation, I'm the cheapest endocrinologist in the city of Doha only. That, uh, okay. And a six month pre prescription for Zumpic costs about 1.1 lakhs. So for 1.5 lakhs, I can guarantee you guys 10 kilo weight, weight loss in six months. So anyone wants to take up the offer, please. But there is a premium option. The premium option, you will fly on Qatar Airways, you will get in-flight entertainment, you will get some drinks. You will stay in a better hotel. There is, uh, in addition to, there's a little bit of sightseeing also included. Consultation is still the same. But we will give you Monjaro. The cost in Doha today for six months of Monjaro is 2.4 lakhs. So for three lakhs, I can guarantee about 20 kilos weight loss. So anyone needs any of this help, please contact me. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Not, not the effective ones, the oral ones. O oral ones are not effective. Correct. Six months is the goal. 10 kilo is a weight loss goal. After that, I've given you a whole talk on dietary management. You have to keep the calories down if you want to maintain the weight. But you have said that the body wants to maintain the calories. Yes, it, it is very difficult, but... Uh, so give it to the very Absolutely no. It, it is no longer BMI. We, we call BMI, the uh, you have classes of obesity, class 1, class 2, class 3, but that is no longer practiced. We use stages of obesity. Stages of obesity is completely independent of BMI. So it depends on what metabolic problems you have, what medical problems you have, what psychological problems you have related to your weight, and what functional problems you have. So you may have someone with a BMI of 28 who has obstructive sleep apnea, who has bad knees or who is psychologically very worried about the weight and is depressed, doesn't get out of the house. So I would 
consider them more serious than someone with a BMI of 35 who's otherwise happy and independent. And, and the Asian population versus American, like same BMI. Mm -hmm. Yes, the BMI. More prone for. Yes, so BMI cutoffs are different, but that is again for classing. We are now talking about staging of obesity. We don't talk about classing anymore. Thank you. She did her MBA from Christian Medical College, Ljubljana. Then she went on to do MD pathology at Sri Ramachandran Medical College, Chennai. She has also done fellowship in renal and transplantation pathology from the US. She is currently working as the director and uh, consultant pathologist at uh, Renopath Center for PD and Urological Pathology, that is in Chennai. And she has multiple publications to her credit. And she will today be talking about acute kidney injury in the tropics and the cystopathological case. Thank you so much, Prabhjot. And it's uh, Louisiana State University. In Shreveport. With, okay, I was with Dr. James Kotlingham then. Yeah. Oh, great. That's so nice. <laughs> Is it possible to switch off these lights? Because I have histopathology pictures that may. Um, so it's truly a great honor. And standing in assembly hall at this stage uh, seems very different because we have all our mighty seniors of 1990 batch whom we interacted so well, sitting on the, you know, them sitting on the window corridors and we standing and having our sessions. Um, the, in the, all those frenzies, the examinations and the baccalaureate service. So this is a new experience to be standing here and giving a talk. Uh, so greetings from Chennai. Can you make it a full screen? Yeah. And in Tamil Nadu. Uh, and it's not moving. Uh, I've chosen this topic because uh, I have specialized in renal and neurological pathology and I did not know what would be uh, fitting for this audience. So I thought acute kidney injury is something that all clinicians at some point of time may have come in contact with. So that's why I've got just four cases and just going very briefly through it. Thank you. So the, the first case. Yeah, it's a 37-year-old gentleman, and Jubin just said we don't follow BMI, uh, but then this patient was obese, and uh, he was just jumping jobs, and uh, during his pre-employment workup, he found out that he's hypertensive, and he had hyperlipidemia, and he was advised to go to a clinician. Now, a week later, he developed loss of appetite and nausea, and a decreased urine output three days later, which made him rush to the physician finally. And at that time, his creatinine uh, was 4.2. He had some proteinuria, and this is ANCA anti-GBN serology is what the nephrologists routinely do for an RPRF case, and it was negative. So the diagnosis was AKI, cause unknown, and a biopsy was done. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so this is the uh, slide here. I have not focused on the glomerulus because it is a tubular interstitial disease, a core of renal tissue. And what you can see is, is there a pointer in this? Yeah, these are the tubules that are packed with crystals. So we have some crystals that are deposited in the tubules. You can see it better when I polarize it. So this is under the polarized uh, yeah, <laughs> polarized slides. So these are colorless birefringent crystals which are pack, uh, packed within the tubular epithelial cells. So that is very diagnostic of oxalate nephropathy. Now why would this person develop oxalate nephropathy at this age? Okay, he's like 37 years. So oxalate nephropathy could be a primary or a secondary and a primary is usually an enzyme deficiency, a hereditary disease who would have presented much earlier to Prabhjot as a pediatric patient. But here he's come, and now the nephrologist has to work up on what is causing oxalate nephropathy in him. So there's a big list of secondary oxalate nephropathy, for which, with a detailed clinical history, they ruled out an enteric hyperoxaluria, they ruled out a number of drugs, 
and this is something we found during the COVID time. A lot of people were on the, you know, they just self-medicating themselves with vitamin C. And vitamin C was uh, causing oxalate to get precipitated and patients were coming with AKI, but he did not give a history. So then we moved on to the drug history, and that's, I mean, the dietary history, and that's when we got the diagnosis. Okay, so this is a fruit which would be very common to people who live in the Konkan and the Malabar coast. It's an extremely sour fruit. You can only, uh, I cannot describe it. You have to taste it to know how sour it is. The pH is just the one, and it's got a very high oxalic acid content, and it is a, within the family of star fruit, and star fruit is known to cause um, dietary hyperoxalosis. So this patient, instead of going to Jubin to reduce his weight, he decided to go to an Ayurvedic doctor. And the Ayurvedic doctor, this is a very well-known remedy for hyperlipidemia, hypertension, and diabetes in Kerala in, among the Ayurvedic practitioners. And this is a paper that uh, was published from Amrita Institute, Kochi, where they analyze normally when the patient has calculi, like a Francis, into his urology, patients with stones would say, uh, you know, reduce your tomato intake, because we consider that as a high oxalate content. But look at the oxalate content here. It's like 25 uh, milligram per 100 grams of the fruit. So this is the what caused his oxalate nephropathy. So kidney biopsy helped him. He just had to stop. He had a few sessions of dialysis and he was back to normal and he went to a physician to get his hypertension and hyperlipidemia treated. So coming to case two, this is a 47 year old male who had high grade in continuous fever with rigors with myalgia and oliguria. He had a creatinine of 9.1 and this was his potassium. Again, AKI cause unknown, they decided to biopsy him. So the glomerulus here is normal, but if you look, you can see within the tubules, there are some of these reddish granules. These are not RBC cars. The morphology of RBC cars are different. We call these pigment cars. And uh, when you see pigment cars, we, we routinely on a renal biopsy, we do four stains and HNE, PA, silver, and trichrome because it is an interplay of these four stains that we decide what the material is. And then, of course, we do the immunofluorescence, which was negative in this case. So this patient had uh, tubular injury with these granular casts within the tubules. So now we do not sign out any report as just AKI. We always give go ahead further because there's a lot of development in renal pathology thanks to proteomics. And now we need to know what this protein is. So then we always do immunohistochemical stains for hemoglobin, which was negative. You can see the cast here. They have not taken up the stain. Whereas immunohistochemical marker for myoglobin is intensely positive. So he is having myoglobinuria causing AKI. So for, to have myoglobinuria, he has to have rhabdomyolysis, right? So what is this patient out of the blue developing rhabdomyolysis, but he had fever. So most likely cause of rhabdomyolysis is infection. So the pathologist signs out the report as myoglobinuric acute tubular injury. Now it's back to the nephrologist to figure out what is the triggering factor. In this case, it was easy because of the fever. So it's most likely infection. But there are a number of causes that they have to actually consider when the patient presents with rhabdomyolysis. Okay, so this turned out to be, uh, oh, sorry, did I miss the previous slide? Yeah, this patient, the IgM for leptospirosis. So they did a full workup for infections, and it turned out to be he had leptospirosis. And you know leptospirosis, wheels disease can involve the kidney, but that just causes acute tubular injury or acute interstitial nephritis. Rhabdomyolysis is exceptionally rare. So we... Uh, Sorry, I'm a little... So we published this um, case here, and there are only one or two other case reports where the leptospiral toxin is directly in uh, causing rhabdomyolysis. Right, so just wanted you to share, because my topic is acute kidney injury in the tropics. So in uh, Tamil Nadu, when what we get, the vast majority of causes of rhabdomyolysis in our patients which present with AKI is animal uh, venom, either snake venom or viper uh, or wasp thing. We have Dr. Um, Kurian Thomas here who's done his thesis many, many, many years ago on kidney biopsies and snake bite um, associated ATI. So I honor you here at this moment. So that is still now, even what, 50 years? Years later, that is still the most common cause of myoglobin, uh, myoglobin associated ATI. But this, I wanted to bring to your notice about 
this cause of exertional rhabdomyolysis. Now, when you say exertional rhabdomyolysis, what would automatically come into your mind is, okay, he's gone to the gym and overworked, or he's run a marathon. But in Tamil Nadu, this is not the cause. There, for religious purposes, people walk for hundreds of kilometers over a period of two weeks to a month to temples and churches across the state, or from Tamil Nadu, they go all the way to Andhra, to Tirupati, in the hot, scorching sun. So they have rhabdomyolysis, they have dehydration, and they have myoglobinuria causing ATI. Another condition is where they do a circambulation, where they roll around, as a part of penance, they roll around the temple or the church. And many of our patients, the cause of exertional rhabdomyolysis in our case series happened to be that. So I just wanted to, I don't know how it is in Punjab, but this is the common thing in Tamil Nadu. Now moving on to case 3. This is a 45 year old male with pulmonary tuberculosis on ATT and um, the physician has done an LFT and a RFT prior to starting ATT which was normal but two weeks later he presented with breathlessness, oliguria and dialysis requiring renal failure. His uh, creatinine was 7.2, his other le levels were raised and he had a hemoglobin of 8.3. So his ATT was immediately stopped and a kidney biopsy was done. Here again, just like the previous case, the tubules are all packed with these pigment cars. These are again not RBC cars, the morphology is different. We call them pigment cars. So what next step? Now we know we do hemoglobin and myoglobin. Here the patient, those pigment cars were hemoglobin cars, negative for myoglobin. So to have hemoglobin in the blood, uh, in the tubules, there should be intravascular hemolysis. So Dr. Joseph John is here, so let's <laughs> focus on him. So what are the causes of intravascular hemolysis? What could possibly have happened? Is it an autoimmune disease? Does he have sickle cell? Does he have cal? But it turned out to be rifampicin is known to cause intravascular hemolysis. Here we have in ours as the largest series uh, to my knowledge in the world, of rifampicin causing um, uh, rhabdomyolysis and, uh, sorry, hemolysis and ATI, because rifampicin can produce a type 2 or a 3 hypersensitivity reaction, especially if patients have taken ATT, stopped for some time and restarted, but this patient claimed that he was continuously taking. And uh, because wh why it happens is uh, these anti-rifampicin antibodies are similar to the blood group antigens, so they cross-react and they can cause a complement mediated hemolysis and this heme pigment is toxic and it can precipitate with the Tamhaus fall protein and present as tubular cas. So the last case. So this is a 14 year old girl with periorbital and pedal edema and oliguria with proteinuria marked nephrotic syndrome here with creatinine of 1.9. So this patient had nephrotic syndrome and acute kidney injury. So um, normally they, uh, age of 14, they do biopsy and if you see nephrotic syndrome, the differentials in a child would be minimal change disease, FSGS or way down would be membranous nephropathy. So this glomerulus looks normal, so it's a non-proliferative, so it could still be one of them. And the diagnosis is made on immunofluorescence, which shows a beautiful granular IgG positive, which is diagnostic of membranous nephropathy. So now in 2024, we do not sign out any report as just membranous nephropathy. Proteomics has come out and we always now we know that there are a number of antigens that uh, are responsible for causing membranous nephropathy. So and each of them has a different pathophysiology, the prognosis and the treatment is different. So we further classify it and sign out the report as what is the antigen causing membranous nephropathy. So this is our series of um, antigen landscape in Tamil Nadu patients of pediatric membranous nephropathy. And these are the different antigens. I'm not going into detail. PLA2R is the most common, exostrosin, NAIL1, and there are a number of antigens. So we do all of them. And then we found out that this child had a NAIL1 positive membranous, which is quite rare in a pediatric population. And in the Western literature, so this NEL1 antigen, that is a neural epithelial-like uh, one antigen that was discovered by mass spectrometry in 2021, end of 2021. And soon after that, they have started making commercial kits for it. So this, uh, what could possibly be causing this in the Western literature, it is associated with malignancy. But obviously this child did not show any evidence. And uh, in our population, 
we found that traditional indigenous medicines in Tamil Nadu, it is the Siddha medicines. Siddha medicine is a type of medicines which is mineral based, which is actually mercury, high levels of mercury is um, there in most of all the Siddha medicines. And we have seen this in our adult population, that Nelvan and Siddha medicines are uh, causing uh, membranous nephropathy, but we have not seen it in the pediatric cases. So we immediately, based on our experience with adults with Siddha medicine, the child and her parents completely denied taking any sort of alternative medicine. So then what could possibly be causing? We did the mercury level and the mercury level was exceptionally high. So th there is definitely mercury toxicity and it's a known thing that mercury can cause membranous nephropathy. But what is the child, where, where is the toxicity coming from? Earlier there used to be the dental fill fillings, the amalgams, but now they no longer use it. Then on further probing, we found that this child was using a skin whitening cream for her acne black spots. She was regularly using it and it was following this that the patient developed nephrotic syndrome. So immediately that was that picture was taken by the nephrologist and sent to me and the next day he sent over the same medicine. We've got the same face cream here, which I don't think you can see the number. It's actually the FDA permissible amount is 0.0003%. So our patient, uh, this medicine had one person, that is 10,000 times more than the upper limit of mercury that is permissive. And that was what was causing it. Now, why I brought this up to the notice is, Normally for membranous nephropathy, it's a very, very um, strong medicine, rituximab, cyclophosphamide, and very cytotoxic drugs that they give. But with Nelvan and mercury causing it, all you have to do is just stop the source of mercury. And within three to six months, the proteinuria, the edema will come down in a few weeks and the proteinuria comes back to normal within three to six months. So this child, we could avoid this because of the proteomics that we did in this study. So to conclude, I know the next topic, Dr. Sandhya is going to talk about genomics. I just wanted to highlight about how proteomics has changed the um, diagnosis of renal pathology. We are routinely, just like light microscopy, immunofluorescence, now we do proteomics in all cases. Electron microscopy is sort of getting uh, phased out, not much. But proteomics has come out in a big way in renal pathology, and that's a recent advance I just wanted to share with you. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you. Oh, which is the pointer? This one. Okay. Ah, okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah, it's done. So thank you. Um, so most of my clinical work relates to epilepsy and neurodisability. No. Sorry, though I always have. What am I doing wrong? So, 
to practice one, the lower one. Ah, okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. So uh, I work in East Yorkshire, and the most defining aspect for me is the cliff-hugging coastal villages. So what I'm hoping to do is give a whistle-stop tour of genomics. Um, I don't think I'll answer all your questions, but I'll try my best. So we're going to briefly look at genomics and genetics, look at the logistics of genomics in rare diseases. So rare diseases collectively impact about 300 million people out of a population of nearly 8 billion worldwide. We look at the role of genomics in precision medicine, and we look at how the role of a pediatrician has evolved. So a genome is an organism's complete set of genetic material, and genomics is the study of genomes. Now, the great progress in the last three decades has been about how quickly we can analyze a human genome, which has got 3.2 billion base pairs. So pre the first time we analyzed a human genome, it took us 10 years, whereas now we can do it under 24 hours, and the cost has reduced to a fraction. In genetics, we study heredity and we look at genes. So we know that 2% of our DNA codes for proteins and the 98% is the non-coding part. So in genomics, we are looking at both the coding and the non-coding part. So we have got 20,000 genes, which accounts for 2%. And it's those 20,000 genes that code for the functional protein, and the rest of it is non-coding. We don't really know what a lot of the non-coding material does, so we don't really know what the 98% of our DNA does, but we know that it probably has a role in regulation and maintenance. And we are all 99.9% .9 similar, that is you and me, but that 0.1% accounts for 3 million base pairs, and that is what makes us all uniquely different. So this is a simple quiz for you. So there is a golden hair tree, a mole, a koala, and the Paris japonica lily. So who do you think has got the most amount of DNA? Any guesses? Sorry? The flower? Anybody else? Koala? OK. The wise man is correct. It is actually, yeah. Yeah, that is the biggest genome that has been sequenced. So the Paris Japonica lily has got 150 billion base pairs compared to 3.2 billion that we carry. The koala is closest to us, so you're right, Shikha, that's 3.4 billion base pairs. And the mole has 6 billion, and the maidenhair tree has got 11 billion. Now, what we don't know is why the Paris Japonica lily carries such a huge amount of genetic material, but what we do know is that there is a lot of repeats in that, which are probably not functional. But what does that, that means that for that nucleus to multiply, it would take that much longer because of the amount it's carrying, and whether that prevents that will slow down reproduction because the less material you have, the quicker the cell can multiply and whether that actually promotes extinction or the fact that you've got so much waste DNA within you, does that pro protect you from mutations? So you're less likely to become extinct. So we don't really know. So that's a world of the genome that we have analyzed so far. Um, so mammals are color coded in bright pink and most mammalian DNA sits between one and six billion base pairs. So how is the genome interpreted? So the biggest advance in technology has been the next generation sequencer. So you take a blood sample, put it through the next generation sequencer, and it reads out all the 3.2 billion base pairs letter by letter. The next step is bioinformatics. So that DNA sequence has to be quality assured. We then have to make sure that it is aligned correctly because you don't want to read it wrong. And thereafter, it is compared against a standardized DNA, and it generates a variant file. So all this is done using technology. And 
It's after the variant file is generated that the scientists get involved. So the clinician would have submitted a clinical phenotype of the patient. So you would look at that and compare it with the variant file. You would look, use statistics and modeling to see which variants are significant. You would look at published literature and see what is out there. And you'd also feed the data into established international genetic databases. And after that, the result is sent out to the clinician. So you could get a genetic diagnosis which provides an explanation for the patient's phenotype. Or you could find a variant of uncertain significance. Or you might find a genetic change which is very relevant but completely unrelated to the question you ask. Or you might get a negative result. But a negative result doesn't really rule out a genetic cause because we are only looking primarily at the 2%. So we don't really know what, uh, what the rest of the 98% that we haven't looked at, whether that has an implication. So what are the different techniques that we can use or the tests that we can order? So we used to do karyotype. Then we moved on to copy number variants, which was microarrays. And so currently, with next, genera uh, next generation sequencing, the most useful test is a targeted gene panel. So to do a targeted gene panel, you have to get the phenotype of the patient right. And most gene panels will look at 200 or 300 genes for a particular phenotype. So in UK, we have a national test directory. So for example, if I had a child with epilepsy, I would ask for an epilepsy gene panel. But if the child had epilepsy and intellectual disability, then I'd combine the two. And if the child had the two and a cortical malformation on the MRI, then I would include a cortical malformation panel. So your question has to be really correct. So I think in pediatrics, we had garbage in, garbage out. So with the technology, because there's a lot of it is computer programming, you have to ask the right question to get the right answer out. And that's the most effective, time-efficient way to do the, utilize this test. And your chances of variance are fairly low with this. The next step is whole exome sequencing, where you'll be looking for the entire coding part. So that is looking at all the 20,000 genes. And currently in UK, we primarily use it in intensive care settings, where you have a child who's suddenly decompensated and you don't have an answer. Now the the advantage with that is you can identify novel genetic causes, but your chances of finding variants of uncertain significance are very high. And then there is whole, exome, whole genome sequencing. We're looking at the entire genome. So both the coding and the non-coding part. Clinically, that's not used as much in practice as yet, primarily because we don't understand the role of the non-coding. And there are, there's a huge amount of data that is generated and high amounts of variants of uncertain significance. So clinical interpretation becomes really difficult. So why is genomics helpful? So you can offer personalized treatment. So there is genetic gene therapy available for cystic fibrosis, for epilepsy, depending on specific channel abnormality. So sodium or potassium channels, you can have epilepsy medicines that ta target the channels. We've already touched on spinal muscular atrophy, Duchenne muscular atrophy. You can have point of care testing for gentamicin toxicity with a turnaround in 15 minutes. So it does have real value. It allows parents to make reproductive choices. So when we do uh, next generation sequencing, we always do it as a tri trial. So you're testing the child with both parents who may be asymptomatic. And in addition, you can offer more informed reproductive choices with pre-implantation biopsy diagnosis. It offers surveillance because sometimes you might pick up, you know, susceptibility to cancer, so you can put them on an enhanced surveillance regime. And it provides information and support to the family. We only have cures for about 10% of the rare conditions. Even if we don't have cures, most families are very grateful for a diagnosis. And what it does is, with social media, it opens them out to connection and support with families worldwide. So what skills do we need as a pediatrician? You have to be aware about the phenotype and, uh, and know when it meets the threshold for genomic testing. 
taking informed consent has become different because you're sometimes testing asymptomatic parents. You need to understand how to interpret the test and communicate that result to the family. And there is managing the genomic diagnosis because increasingly we're all carrying more numbers of rare disorders in our caseload and supporting research. And geneticists have become our best friends. So previously with neurology, it used to be neuroradiologists or neurophysiologists, but now it's a geneticist who's our best friend. So where do we go next? So currently we are testing mainly children who are symptomatic. So the next level would be screening. So, and the ideal place to start is newborn screening. So newborn screening trials worldwide have happened in many countries and they're listed out there. There are huge ethical, philosophical, and economic debates that need to happen around newborn testing. And in UK, we are just embarking on testing 100,000 newborns for 250 genetic conditions. So where does this lead to? So we know that we will get more accurate diagnosis with genomics, but what you need is a huge amount of infrastructure support that needs to go with it. It will lead to precision treatment, which will be very expensive as it stands. So in US, for the three, 300 million rare disorder patients worldwide. In US, they use almost half their health budget to support these uh, patients. So what we have to consider is how much are we willing to invest in precision treatment? And again, there are economic and philosophical and ethical decisions around that. Genetically, we are all programmed to die from the day we are born. And what we need to consider is how much do we want to invest to prevent the inevitable. So will, our, will it change our practice? Absolutely. So I think we have to understand, learn, engage, and influence the change. And I've just listed out some of the open access websites which are very useful. Thank you. There's a lot of um, ethical discussions that need to happen. So for even the newborn screening, there was this national discussion to decide which conditions to select, because you potentially want to select something where you can offer a treatment, or you, know, you would offer enhanced surveillance, or you know that death was almost inevitable. So th those are some of the discussions that need to happen. And with the pre-implantation diagnosis, it's not more about I think rather than Coriolis villa sampling, where you would go in those circumstances is using IVF and pre-implantation diagnosis. We are selecting the non-affected embryo to progress with the pregnancy. Yeah, sorry? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we use it for a lot of mitochondrial disorders, you know, where, where there isn't an effective treatment available. So we have a
about myself. I we had a very nice, interesting medical sessions. I will not be able to give you any, any <laughs> teaching except my experience. After completing MBBS, I worked in Mission Hospital after work, after doing, came back to do DGO. After completing DGO also, I went back to Mission Hospitals in various places, Madhya Pradesh and Uttaranchal Pradesh. Uh, now Uttaranchal Pradesh, there is a district. And later I went to work in Mission Hospitals in uh, Maharashtra. First I worked for uh, for nearly a decade in a, in Pune, uh, in a very famous institution. Uh, I was the medical in ad uh, administrator as well as the superintendent for nearly eight years. And uh, after, in 1993, I decided that enough of social work, I must now earn for myself and my old age. And um, I came to Ambarnath where my parents had been living. My mother was a medical officer in the local uh, ordnance factory hospital as a, and uh, uh, my father and brothers were there. So I decided to open a private practice there only because I was known to, I, I knew mo many people there. So I was very comfortable. I have never faced big challenges in my life. I never like to go to unknown places. So I stayed back where I was known and people knew about me and uh, knew me and my family. This is the way uh, I started private practice in uh, Ambarnath. I didn't have a home of my own because uh, I was, I had been working in mission hospitals, didn't have a lot of cash with me. And um, so I was living with my brother and uh, had started own clinic and uh, and later started in hospital practice with one of our local friends. So because as gynecologist I needed a hospital to operate in. That's how I started working and uh, slowly I got hold of my practice. It didn't take very long. Uh, but there were several people who knew my parents and their charitable work. And even they knew my history from uh, of mission hospitals. Uh, one evening while I was in the clinic, one local politician came to me and said, want to show you something. I said, okay, after, after the clinic is over, I will go with you. She didn't tell me what she's going to show. So after I made her wait till the clinic was over late in the evening, it was ne nearly 9 p.m. She took me to one very close by, there was one uh, Joparpati area where there was, she took me to a house When I entered the room, I was shocked. After working in MP and Dehradun district, I had uh, encountered many malnutrition cases, especially in MP, even in rural Maharashtra. But I never expected any malnutrition in Ambarnath, which is an industrial town. Like nearly all people get work. And they are at least able to eat two meals and feed their children. There were <laughs> photos hai kya beta? No, no, I'm so dependent on
Anyway, I will show. Uh, can you see this small baby? But worse than this, case, two babies and a mother all lying down had no energy to get up. There was, I, I am not able to, I'm sorry. First baby, first baby. I'll tell, I'll tell the whole story of this, but how Anugra came to being, I'll let me explain to you. I saw the babies and I referred them to the, take them to this ashram, take them to that ashram, this hospital, that hospital, all the local hospitals that I knew with pediatricians, expert pediatricians. I asked them to transfer the babies there and they said, we have already been, nobody trans wants to take care of them. I said, Aisa ne ho sakta, koi to karega. Jao. I didn't have a home of my own. I didn't have a hospital of my own where I could admit. And these, ba and these babies that I saw were struggling for life. And uh, how long they will live, I didn't know. So I couldn't take the risk. So I said, I'm sorry, I cannot do anything. I can only refer them to some places. We've been everywhere. We are not more interested in going anywhere. If you, if you can, you treat. I said, I can, but I have no way, means to keep you. you, you I cannot treat you this severe malnourished dying cases in your home. So I said, I cannot do anything for you. I came back, but that became a nightmare for me. I could not sleep. As a medical professional, I have not been true to my profession. I have said to dying children, I cannot help you. I had restrictions, but I, um, but it became a nightmare for me. I couldn't sleep. After 10 days, I asked that, I called that politician and said, please take me to that place again. I went there, inquired, not only the babies, their mother also had died of severe malnutrition. Of course, accompanied diseases. Nobody was there. Neighbors were not willing to show their faces. They were avoiding any answer. And I couldn't believe. And this became a nightmare for me. I said, baby is dying just for lack of some simple medicines and food. And, and I say to them, I cannot do anything. I kept on telling myself, you know, somebody should do something about it. Let me find out who will do. And I to find out all over, tried to find out all over Bombay. And they said, you are a doctor, you know whether the babies will live or not. If they will not live, why should we take? Uh, newspapers aake hamara photo chapne ke liye hum lenge kya? I was very disappointed in them. And suddenly one idea struck to me. My father owned a little land close by, just out of the city that time. Now it's in the middle of the city. That's, the place has grown up so much. So I asked him, will you give me my share of the land? He was reluctant. He said, Tu akeli kya karegi? Tu kuch ne kar sakegi? And, you, and you'll, only, you'll only gain negative publicity. Anyway, my sister helped me. She supported me and she, she said, not only give her her share, give my share also to her of the land. So taking these two shares of land, I built a small house, hoping to take care of five, six, maximum 10 children. I, the day I operated on cases, cesareans, hysterectomies, or others also. Uh, in fact, I did a lot of uh, appendectomies 
emergency appendectomy is also added. So, um, the day I operated, I bought material from my yard. Every day, OPD earnings. I got the team to build the house. And, um, you know, as though God didn't know, I, when I started the work, my father was very worried. You are only wasting your money and time and energies. Nothing will come out of it. My sister said, don't discourage her, let her do. So I asked my father one question. Don't I have a right to fail? I may start something. As I have a right to do well, I have also a right to fail sometimes. If I fail, let it be. I will restart, I'm not dying. I will restart my life. I'm not buddhi also as yet. And um, so my father had no answer to that. Finally, um, we, even before we completed the house, in my opposite to my clinic, there was a lawyer's office. And when there were difficult divorce cases with him, Some poor people, he started referring to me. I said, why should I look after? Why don't you and your community look after? Because he was a Buddhist leader also. So I said, why you, your community, you look after? He said, is my community ka kya sawal hai? Is ka? <laughs> anyway, what happened before even I completed building the house, um, I children were placed in my care. I made them live in my helper's, cleaner's house. And then uh, I com did the emergency complete chain of building. And um, started in 1996, a small home. Initially, I invited servants. Uh, I paid them also and then made them sit, be with them, with, be with the children. Finally, I found the children that I had taken were, were just used by the servants to do all the work and the servants just enjoyed. So I removed the servants and I decided to look after the children myself. My father accompanied with me. And we both were there in the house. To, he was already there before I went there. And uh, Anugre started then because of the one special case of Krupa. This is the case. I, I, I got publicity. Krupa, this is the whole story of Krupa. This lady brought, this lady brought Krupa to me. Severe rickets, not a single bone in her, her body was straight, malnourished, and alcoholic. Her father fed her, fed her only alcohol after her mother's death. No food was given, no milk was given. After I took, took her in, she next day only, nay, it took me two days to realize she was alcoholic. And then uh, uh, she, that history was not given to me. I realized she was alcoholic. She couldn't sleep. She couldn't, uh, like, and she'll keep on saying chai, chai, chai. Any amount of food given to her did not satisfy her. Anyway, I didn't give alcohol. That was the prescribed thing to start giving her small doses of alcohol. But what happened, 
her pelvic floor collapsed totally with all her innards out it it was nearly the worst case of malnutrition i had seen very slowly i had to, I had to work a lot but very slowly we nursed her back to health it took 3 weeks of feeding and caring that her pelvic floor was able to keep the innards in and then very slowly she was she got into some fast track it took one year to reverse her rickets and it uh, it took a long time of feeding and caring and then we discovered the alcohol had done its damage to her brain she was very poor she was 3 and a half she came but till 5 she could not talk properly she understood many words but she couldn't talk she learned talking very slowly and other physical activities today she somehow completed 10th standard ssc board and uh, maharashtra board 10th standard she finished she learned to cook in our house i was very apprehensive of sending him in her into kitchen because she was so weak physically and we cooked lot of food i was scared that she will drop on herself and we have burn injuries but uh, behind my back she learned to cook now she is married and has a one year old baby uh, we celebrated the baby's birthday in december that's the kind of journey we took in case of krupa veronica is the baby's name and this is the family her husband krupa before this while i was in i want to share the story of one more girl she came with the name lakshmi but when i when i first received her i changed her land name to rahel rahel was brought to me in mission hospital from mumbai a very big hospital bhatia hospital this is the story of 91 in 90s early 90s there was uh, uh, a very strong fear of hiv affected as soon as um, uh, hiv positive report came the doctors discharged them from the hospital and uh, the relatives threw them out of the house most people died of the committed suicide adults and the children because of lack of care at 2 o'clock in the night a pastor and his team from mumbai came to me in pune bringing a 11 month old baby they didn't say one word the baby was in shock had not received any food and iv all the veins were already uh, already used she could hardly breathe when she came to me because it's nearly 5 years hours journey from bombay to pune they had brought in a car the hospital had sent the iv set with them but there was no nurse to take care of the baby in the in the vehicle that they brought this baby was found by unix in a garbage uh, 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 area and handed over to this pastor to take to be taken care of because they didn't want the baby to be uh, to die in the garbage 
this pastor and his team admitted them in, the, in a very big hospital called Bhatia Hospital in Mumbai. And uh, morning they admitted around 11 a.m. By 9 p.m. they found the HIV report was positive. Immediately they wrote on the paper discharged against medical advice and handed over this baby to the pastor. He held her and wondered what I, what I will do with this baby. What can I do with this baby? I cannot just hold in my arms and let allow the baby to die. So this pastor knew me and my work, so he, he immediately called his team to arrange for a vehicle and brought her to five hours journey away in a rural hospital. I was shocked. I said, what to do with this baby now? OK, I'll just finish into, to, was just finish, just this story. <laughs> I mean, so this baby was um, brought to me and um, I ordered the nurses barrier nursing and we took care of this baby. She, she survived. After 11 months, the pastor took her back, back. This baby, because she survived and because she started doing well, this pastor was able to generate several lakhs of donation from Germany, Netherlands, Switzerland, and started a home for such destitute children and uh, started three clinics in Mumbai. I think they already had a rural um, uh, center, health center and a, but for HIV special. And when I went to Ambarnath, I started working there as a consultant for HIV. Thousands and thousands of HIV affected were cared for there because of this baby story that she could survive. This has been one of the major achievements of my life that even today, before the uh, Gates Foundation came in with the HIV drugs free of cost, so many were being treated because actually HIV was not the killer. It was the depression, the neglect, the homelessness of an uh, emotional trauma to patients, that was the killer. So <laughs> when people found little hope that we can be treated by doctors, because that had become, uh, that was fed to them. So when they found one doctor and slowly other doctors I was nearly the first one. My Rahel was the first baby in Maharashtra to be uh, diagnosed as HIV positive. I've kept taking care of HIV positive children, parents' children in my hostel, positive and negative both. They've all grown into adulthood. I have not lo lost one. Everybody is doing well. They became little uh, difficult to handle because of extra care was given to them. So, so emotionally they became both larka. But uh, <laughs> uh, they've all survived. None of my HIV affected patients while in my care died. So it was only due to medical fraternities delay and uh, desire not to touch them made them commit suicide. It was not the disease or medical neglect. They went to the hospital private practitioners who put in unhygienic way high, IV drips. They got infected and nobody treated them and they died. That was the story. So I've been instrumental by God's grace for care of HIV affected in slums. 
I had law from far away eunuchs coming to me in these Dharavi slums for treatment. Time over. Thank you. I told, because I had children in my home, we started a home school, but the government didn't allow. We now have a school also registered since 2005, and uh, we were able to work for Adivasi children where there were no, ch no students. Now girls have done ITI and working, and uh, several of my girls have graduated, children who were destitute, homeless. More, I take basically homeless children. Uh, it says there, there are more than 400 children in the school. Around 125 girls uh, and uh, about 30 boys. Some stayed for shorter period, some stayed for longer period. There are many who have graduated post-graduation, working as research scientists, working as uh, accountant, CA. Uh, one girl has her own taxation office. So several have done very, very well. Thank you so much, Dr. Ila Paul, for sharing such an incredible journey of yours. Uh, very inspiring. And uh, after this, we move on to the next speaker. Uh, we have Dr. V. Srinivasan from the 1974 batch. Sir, did his undergraduation uh, MBBS from Christian Medical College, Ludhiana, and followed, that, followed by MS General Surgery again from CMC Ludhiana. After that, he went on to do his MCH in plastic surgery from KMC Chennai and also did microsurgery fellowship uh, from Australia. He's currently working as the senior consultant in the Department of Plastic Surgery in Sri Ramachandran Medical College and Research Institute at Chennai. Uh, Sir so would be talking uh, on uh, vascularized free fibula, a versatile option in recon reconstructive microsurgery. Good afternoon. Thank you for a wonderful presentation, um, Dr. Ila. I think your work is so commendable. I don't think many people could have achieved and touched so many lives. This place, of course, gives nostalgic memories. All of us assembled here to Every one of us who assembled here, I mean our batch, sat here, wrote the entrance exam, we gave the interview and finally got selected. I think after a few years even that was stopped. It became later online and so on. We wrote all our professional exams here, we played badminton. Now I think the ceiling has come down so we can't. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, my topic, uh, is on vascularized fibula. I know with a mixed crowd, it may not be as relevant as many of the other talks, but I'll try to keep it as interesting as possible. It'll be mostly photographs with some inputs from me. I, light is not moving. Yeah, sorry. Currently, I work in the same institution, which uh, I have been since 1996. And I'm no longer the head of the department. I work with my colleague, who has been with me for almost 25 years. And these are the places to which I have had an opportunity to use fibula to fill some bone gaps. But I'm not going to take you through every one of them, only a few of those defects. Um, mandible is probably one of the commonest areas in which fibula is used. And uh, without a reconstruction, this is known as an anti gum deformity. They don't have chin and they have all these problems listed out. 
So in addition to appearance, they have these functional issues. So while appearance is what everybody is bothered about externally, they would rather have all the other things sorted out. And same with hemi hemimandibulectomy patients. The tumor is removed, sometimes radiotherapy is given, rest of the reconstruction is delayed. There was a time when patient, people used to wait for them to uh, be tumor free for five years before they offered, but nowadays everything is more or less done at the same time. When you have cases uh, like this, there are many options which plastic surgeons offer. And uh, the last one, of course, requires a microvascular training and uh, input. The rest of them can be done by regular um, surgery. And of course, the reconstruction plate is predominantly used by the oromaxillofacial surgeons. But though it may be a quick fix and it gives a contour, these plates do get exposed either internally or externally, and it's not a permanent uh, solution. Plastic surgery options-wise, there are many. The simplest one being just putting a bone graft, uh, bone cancerous bones and so on, but for long and large defects and especially core to, close to a oral cavity, these don't succeed and hence it's always best to use a vascularized uh, microvascular flap. These are the various flaps which people consider and in this ilium and uh, fibula, these are probably the commonest ones. But from 1996 onwards, vascularized fibula has been the one which most people use. Before that, ileum used to be used. There are some technical issues with the other two flaps, but I don't think I will go into it. Now, when you use an ileum, you get predominantly cancerous bone, and it is curved and sometimes it doesn't fit into the defect where you want to put it. You cannot do an osteotomy. The pedicle length also is not large. And uh, you have to cut through the abdominal wall, which means they, are, they can develop hernia and pain. And since it's no longer used unless other options are run out. But when you use a fibula, you have all these uh, plus points. In a tall person, you can almost get 25%, not that you need the entire length. But we have to mandatorily leave 25, sorry, five centimeters close to the ankle for stability and another five centimeters or so at the upper end to protect the common peroneal nerve. And we get the chance to use the skin paddle overlying it by using those perforators which run uh, through the septum. Now, all of us have an emotional attachment to fibula because that was one bone which sometimes used to make us fail in anatomy and also get the best. So I think somehow I was destined to use fibula in my life uh, for the purpose. And I think, I don't know whether nowadays fibula is still being given to students. Anyway, um, the Peroneal artery is what the artery which supplies the fibula and it takes off from the posterior tibial artery. And that is the one which we chase and dissect and finally use. These are the, you can use just the fibula based on the peroneal artery. You can use it through the septum, the skin paddle overlying it. You can also use the flexahalysis and sometimes soleus in addition to if you want to have a contour cover. And if you want extra length of uh, blood vessel, then you trace it almost up to the nutrient foramen, so you get the be benefit of endosteal and periosteal blood supply. And uh, the advantage is you can do osteotomy and make it into two or three pieces. Rarely for a mangled hand, we may have to do uh, reconstruct about three metacarpals and so on. I have not done such a reconstruction, but it is used. And uh, the periosteal cuff is retained so that at least one type of blood supply nourishes the bone. 
Again, the skin paddle has a long septum, so you can swing it in any direction and drape it over areas which you want. And there are situations in which you want the skin paddle on one side and the blood vessel anastomosis will be on the other. And there also you get the chance to use it. Now, there is one condition known as peronia magna. That is, in that limb, peroneal artery is the only blood vessel which actually is a dominant vessel. And if you take it, the foot can become gangrenous. Before imaging and other things used to come, once in a while people have um, uh, had that complication. Anyway, clinically we always assess. Now with uh, CT angiograms and so on being so um, affordable, it's always done to make sure that the patient doesn't have peronia magna, which is a contraindication for this procedure. And of course, if you have a shattered fibula due to various, uh, I mean, other injuries and so on, obviously you cannot use it. And when you use a fibula, of course, you use that skin paddle over, lower, overlying the lower and middle one third. The perforators are marked by Dopplers and you, on that, that skin paddle is based so that you can use it for cover. And you, okay, in the 90s, we used to use the entire deep fascia. Now we just take that blue portion to cover the peroneus longus. And that would be a small piece of fibula with a perforator, with a pedicle and overlying skin paddle. Um, so I'll show a few clinical examples of its use in long bones and some on mandible. And uh, always in plastic surgery, planning is important. A lot of interaction with uh, anesthetist and also with the referring surgeons, either orthopedic or facio maxillary or oncosurgeons. And uh, the part which has to be the ramus, the body is all predetermined. And uh, initially we used to just use x-rays, uh, templates, and uh, dental mold and so on, but with um, modern medical and evidence-based things. Nowadays, we even use the computer-aided design and uh, some 3D printing. So if that is the fibula, and that's the half of the mandible which is removed, we take a dental mold, also bend the reconstruction plate, and finally get into the shape of a hemimandible. And in the long pedicle, uh, we can deliver it wherever it's wanted. If you are bothered about ischemia time, which may kill some cells and so on, bone probably doesn't matter so much, but when you use muscle, uh, ischemia period should be reduced. Then sometimes this shaping can be done even with the pedicle attached to the limb, so that once you clip it, uh, you just have to straight away anastomose. These are, uh, sometimes these 3D models are made, and now the, we work with the dental college also. These are 3D models and they mark out which uh, pieces they want. They even give the cutting angles and then we use that to um, help in doing the osteotomy. But always we retain the periosteal blood supply and in the main segment, both the endosteal and periosteal. So those pieces are then realigned and delivered into where it's needed. So when you use the anterior segment or lose the anterior segment, the tongue can fall back, they can choke, and you have to get it into the right place and make sure they can not only articulate, uh, but the tongue stays inside but does not go too far down. It's a gunshot injury. It was referred to us, and that's the mandible which has been carved and placed where it needs to be. And those are the pre-op, post-op. He was a Nigerian, so we don't have a long-term follow-up. Later on, we found that he was a wanted criminal. Anyway, that's a radiation necrosis of the mandible following radiotherapy for CA tongue. And uh, you can see that the entire mandible has got eroded. Only the ramus stayed in place. So we had to bridge the gap and uh, do the whole thing. What you see, uh, lower down on that side is the viable skin paddle, which can be later on thinned. And if the patient desires, we can do the titanium implant um, teeth. And sometimes you have 
people with ameloblastoma, that is benign but locally recurrent tumor, and this is from a northeast, and you remove the tumor along with the central segment of the mandible, and uh, get the reconstruction plate and the fibula shape to the post uh, shape you need, and the fixation is not great, they had some technical problem, but anyway, externally you cannot make out the difference, um, this patient has not yet come for follow-up, but we do, uh, that's from Tripura, but we do get images and reassurance from them. To get the profile, to get the appearance to near normal so that people will still recognize them is important, otherwise they become unhappy. Now, when you have a lateral segment, it's less challenging, and after nine months, often it integrates, and uh, if you have made the incision suturing and so on, it does settle out well. And uh, a lady, and again on the lateral side, this would be that sort of a line uh, diagram. We anastomose it usually to the superior thyroid artery, external jugular vein, and the side branch to the thing. Pre-op, post-op. Suturing again has to be a bit more meticulous. This one was not sutured as well as we would prefer. I told them about, I told you about dental uh, reconstruction. These are ones with uh, osseointegrated implants. Okay, sure. And uh, when it comes to long uh, bone defects, we prefer that we get the fibula. This is a child with a flop missing humerus and uh, that has been replaced with vascularized fibula and now she has full cover, I mean, full control over the limb. This, of course, needs to be lengthened later on. Can you move it? It's like this. Can you move it? Oh, okay. Evening sarcoma replaced with the humerus. I mean, humerus replaced with the fibula. And uh, child has in control over it. Tibial defects, pseudoarthrosis, reconstructed. And uh, 13 years follow-up, she is able to walk. I'll just come down to the last few slides. These are for the forearm. Anyway, I should dedicate this talk to our professors, Professor T.C. Farabin, Dr. Bindra, and Dr. Abraham Thomas, because Unlike the current MBBS students, we were posted with them four years and, uh, via the fourth year, and at that time itself, I developed a liking to plastic surgery. Then with encouragement, I took it up, and then that's Dr. Bindra. And uh, later on, after doing my MCH, I had the privilege and pleasure of working with Professor Abraham Thomas for five years, and he mentored me for microvascular surgery. And this is a more recent picture um, with him. And the important thing is to have a team. Initially, I had the opportunity to build a team. Later on, I, when I went, I had to join a large team. And that unit had about six or seven microsurgeons. And I realized that if you have a large team, the physical work, the psychological stress, and so many things get distributed. We may feel that you know you have lost the importance, but I think your longevity in a particular specialty keeps increasing. And success, I think, is directly uh, proportional to teamwork as well as it reduces stress. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Srinivasan, for such an insightful talk. Since we are running short of time and we've got three more uh, speakers, uh, maybe we can take the questions in the end after the uh, talks are over. So uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Mary Kurian. I would request her to come, please. Um, uh, Dr. Mary Kurian did her undergraduation uh, MBBS and uh, DLO and MS uh, uh, EMP. Yeah, MBBS from Christian Medical College. And then she went on to do her DLO and MS uh, in uh, uh, Autorhino uh, in ENT. She is currently working as a senior consultant and she's the head of ENT at uh, uh, Naruvi Hospitals in Velour, Tamil Nadu. 
And today, ma'am will be talking about uh, the, the topic is Golden Milestone, the journey, destination, and beyond, an ENT experience. I, I don't know. Thank you very much for introducing me. Just uh, I, most of the people here are my classmates. And uh, just to tell you, after leaving, after leaving uh, CMC Velo, we, I mean CMC Ljubljana, after my MBBS, I joined the CMC Velo for my MS. And I have been working there since then till my retirement. And then I went to Pondicherry Institute of Medical Sciences and worked there for another 10 years. And now I work in a private hospital. So that is my long journey. Um, yeah, I can take off that picture. <laughs> Shall we go to the next slide? Do you have my slides? I'm not sure whether I got it. Yeah. Uh, where's the light? Huh? Ah, yeah, right, I got it. Yeah. Uh, I, I actually, after speakers from the morning, and then we had Dr. Hila's experience, and then uh, Srinivasan's uh, vascular surgical experience. I know I did ENT at the surgery, and I'm fairly passionate about it. I just want to take you all through what actually is our life about and what could I have done or what could I do more, but more for the youngsters if there are many or at least people who are continuing to be teachers and medical profession as well. What we have lost out or what we have lost in the coming years and where we have to draw a check. And this is more of a you know, looking back time and the right way, I feel the way forwards, otherwise our profession will be lost. So it is more like that. And um, so that's why the ENT is my own speciality. That's why I put, and I don't know whether you can look the color green, yellow, and red. It, it's exactly the color of our emblem, our logo. Basically they say is, uh, anyhow, I won't go to that. I won't have enough time. So, doesn't work. Okay. So, like um, everyone knows, we all started in the anatomy department. Oh, oh. Doesn't work, does it? Oh. Oh, it's there, is it? Am I doing the wrong one? No, that's a light. Ah, yes, sorry, oh, sorry, <laughs> I did the wrong arrow. I never realized, you know, that when we did our anatomy posting, we were all very happy to do, but it took me so many years to realize the very profound statement. They were yesterday's patients, and they were the silent teacher of tomorrow's doctor. You know, I now I started telling my youngsters, sometimes we meet or we have this stethoscope ceremony and... Uh, uh, you know, white coat ceremony. That's when I started saying this. It's so true, you know, and it's so important that we tell the youngsters how to respect them. Earlier, I know we used to call cadavers, isn't it? We actually should call what? Human donors. They are our human donors for our education. So the respect should start from there. Anyhow, this is a long journey, I know. I was an ENT, then the past 10 years I moved on to pediatric ENT because I was happy about it. We started the pediatric ENT fellowship, university fellowship in Tamil Nadu University. And it's very sad, it's still the only fellowship that's going on in CMC Vellore. Well, no one in India had takers for it. I tried my best to take some more to have a standard fellowship program. It still has to take on, but in the West there is, I know that. Anyhow. What did I learn? What can I share? That's all I'm going to tell today. I think I don't know whether there anyone in the faculty here, but students, but I will, and I feel even if we are getting old, we can still change uh, to the society, our roles change, but let it be a common thing that I have to share. You know, when we came for anatomy, you know, we all felt as though we were on a sea, you know, don't know what to do, what to do, how to study, what is this anatomy? And it took me many years even to know the statement to study the phenomena of disease. Without books, it's like going in an uncharted sea. Hear that. But to study without patience, 
is not to have gone to the sea at all. It's Sir William Osler, the father of clinical medicine. It is a pity that our curriculum does not have a chapter on Sir William Osler. If you go to, um, what do you say, paintings, so much their stu study starts with Michelangelo, Picasso. You go to literature, Shakespeare, nothing of the history of medicine. It's a pity, at least some people should th think about it. And to come cut a long story short, we went into the clinical, preclinical, pre 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 paraclinical, and those days, I think in anatomy, we never had any exposure to the clinical side, but now they have integrated. You know, the stakeholders have brought down. But like, like Shitrinivasan said, the introductory lectures and the posting was always by senior doctors. And even the first few theories, first few clinics, and then we were made into small groups. I think they still have it, morning and night clinics. We didn't realize why, you know, till it took us years, I mean, few more years to understand why they did this. So why? It is for us to watch the truth situation, listen to your patient. He is telling you the disease, diagnosis, care more for the symptoms, care more for the patient, not the symptoms. Finally, great, be compassionate, this the patient understands. Again, Sir William Osler. So these words we will all understand, yes? But we have to see it to be seen. So actually, if you go to the curriculum, I don't know you all, uh, who is still in teaching. Five years ago, uh, National Medical Council brought in, you have to have these subjects. And they called it, I don't know anyone who is in medicine, they called it ATCOM, which is attitude, uh, you know, attitude, ethics, and communication. Nowhere in the world they use this word, but that is what the Indian curriculum brought in. We were taught by our teachers, greet the patient, listen to his story. These days they call it, what's the term they call it these days in medicine? People teaching undergraduates, they call it communication etiquette. We were never told that, we saw it, that's it. And then, then the next came, we listened to their story, communication in good faith. Tell, tell them, give them highest care. How will you give highest care? You need knowledge, you have to keep up to date, you have to have your skills ongoing. If your findings are limited, you need to call your colleague. So these are the highest care. So there is a lot of things involved and you must first of all know conflict of interest. That means you should, should dissociate for any other conflict of interest with the patient. These are all taught to medical students and they use the term good clinical practice. I am sure you all know, we learned all this without these terms of etiquette, good clinical practice, but over the years we learned so, but we were watching and we did see. Now there's yet another one. What will all these two, why I'm saying is the medical curriculum brings this. It is called, you see the patient has right to know, which means in your communication you have to tell them these are the things, you make the decision, we will help you autonomy. I am going to do my best beneficial, do risk. All this, all of you know, but I, I'm sure when I, we did, these words were not told into us, but we learned over the years. It took us time. Now they call it medical ethics. Why I am saying this is, I don't know, who, those who are in active medical education, I think the teachers or whoever is in teaching will know that the Medical education is going into a problem where we cannot address this, and I will tell you why. So why are, are all this taught? So you need communication etiquette, you need good clinical practice and medical education. Why? I don't know, I, when, when we watched our teachers, we go to clinics, we know, we already know the patient is sick and the teacher knows what he is saying. Yes, we felt it from their communication. But now it's, they, we have been told, you have to tell the patient this, why? They don't have time for clinics. It's all taught in the classroom, you see? 
So you have to tell the students, patient is vulnerable and doctor is powerful. There's a truth in it, but we saw and learned it. But there is no, there's so much of students per class, not in a faculty, this is not happening to be seen, but is taught. But we have to raise the patient to our level, which means communicate him, greet him, make him comfortable, lift him up to our level so that he develops some trust. So this, this has to be taught to them more than they see. It's not, it's not the ideal way. Seeing and taught, learning, doing, hearing, seeing, that process has, there is a shortness in that. Why do we say is, if you look, it's an unequal situation, isn't it? One is up and one is down. So balance wise, huh? 10 more minutes, three minutes. So that's how. So we have to make them equal. I just wanted to use the word fiduciary, but I don't think anyone in the crowd is actively teaching. We are supposed to teach medical students the word fiduciary also. So to me, it is all weird. I just want to say in the present scenario, so much patience, so much technology, heavy demands, we are not, there is a loss of human touch in the doctor, student, and patient. We call it dehumanization. It is not the joke. We call it humanoid. If you look in the nation, that is the way our character is going on to. How can we avoid it? You must remember all this. We have a humanity and technology. We cannot ignore both. But how do you combine? Humanity, technology cannot praise humanity. Its technology is good, it's efficient. But you have to have the, you, have, you cannot compromise on humanity. So there is a term now called humanizing technology, which means take the compassion of humanity to the competency of technology. One cannot ignore this in the background of technology. You must remember. And I won't go to this because I don't see any medical students, so I'll go through this. So all that I want to tell the faculty is, last June, the National Medical Council has put in a national aim and goal. Health for all and make the doctor first effective. And look at the characters of the doctor he has given. Clinician, communication, leader, member, health guy, life commoner. It's a very tall, and they brought in a something called competency-based medical education. I don't know if anyone in the ground will understand. When I came to hear this, I didn't know what it meant. I asked my colleagues, none of them knew, but they still, the system boasts that they have implemented it. It's something which we need. When we look at the curriculum, Majority, we have all the characters is goes into, one is majority is uh, knowledge, then skills, other one is attitude. But we just cannot, it's a hidden curriculum. We have to have our students watching our teachers at their workplace to get that. So, and also there is something called EPAs. I don't think it's a time to say, but you have to have an EPA. So, our education and the medical curriculum is gone into a severe situation where we have a grossly suboptimal student teacher, especially clinical, very sad. And unless the faculty or the teaching of every medical college put this to the stakeholders, our, our curriculum and, and our medicine career, medical career is, profession is going to be a very sad state, the faculty, not feasible, they get burnt out. You have un un patients who are unhappy about unethical. The medical doctor is busy teaching, not looking at students, things like that. So this is an issue which cannot be ignored. So all that I want to say is the need criteria very unlikely and anyone in a teaching profession cannot sit back and accept this criteria. Your national aim, not the goal is very unlikely. You, you all have the moral responsibility and the way forwards to sit with the policy makers, make, make your note go for a humanized medicine. It is going to, otherwise, 10 years down the lane, you are going to realize it's too late to put back the clock. 
I don't know, I just passionate about it. I had to share it. That is the reason. Thank you very much for your patience. Man. Well, I remember the day, the 29th of July 1993, when I stepped into this uh, hall as an MBBS student along with my colleagues. And thanks to the Lord and thanks to the blessings of my parents that we have all been able to complete 25 years and we have joined again. It's nervousness because my teachers are present here at the talk and it is confidence that my batchmates are also present so I can goof up a little bit. Uh, this was... Uh, This was, a, uh, this was a study which was already published and uh, presented in the American Diabetic Association last year. Uh, I took up the task of uh, tri-parameters diabetes observational study where we, where we checked the uh, patient's HbA1c, the blood pressure and the LDL levels and we wanted to detect what is the current scenario of our country. So this was presented where we found out that most of, most of the young diabetic populations are most susceptible for coronary artery disease. And uh, the main intention of doing was the study was because these young people are going to be tomorrow's adults and they'll be having a disease burden in them which can be prevented at this moment. So as we know that diabetes has got a lot of morbidity and mortality and uh, um, according to IDF, according to RSSDI, the estimates the number of diabetic populations are increasing day over. India has got a disturbing figure when we look to the ICMR data. Uh, most and most of people are turning out to be diabetic, not only the urban, but also into the rural class. Yes, the significant risk factor of uh, diabetes where we check the HbA1c, the blood pressure, and the LDL cholesterol levels, uh, which is a very, very well established marker for managing cardiovascular disease. Management is on all levels, right from the primary care to the diabetologist, to the cardiologist, to the consultant physicians. The, the cutoff criteria was taken as LDL of less than 100, the blood pressure of less than 130, 80, and the HbA1c of less than 7. This is according to the RSSDI guidelines. Uh, we conducted this study, which was passed by the Ethics Committee and approved by the CTRI. The purpose of this real-world study was uh, this, this study was actually performed at 14 different sites all across the country and uh, all around 11 cities in the, in, the city, in the country. And the purpose was to basically integrate the data and find out what exactly is happening in our community at different parts. Most of the leading diabetologists, cardiologists, cardiodiabetologists were, en were enrolling patients in this study. And this was the cutoff which we kept for the patient population. Now, data was analyzed statistically, and fortunately, I got the opportunity to present this study in the European Society of Cardiology at Singapore, as well as in UK Diabetes in uh, London. Now, look at the alarming results. Out of the 2,000 patients that we had the clear data which was enrolled, if we look over here, it was, if we look over here, 
it was only 3.5% of the entire population which we have studied was able to maintain the HPA1C, the blood pressure and the LDL cholesterol in the normal ranges which was required, which was alarmingly very, very low. And if we look to the other side, it was the elderly population above 50 or the middle-aged population who had crossed 50. They were able to have a significant better control while drastically patients who were less than 35 years of age, our young population was absolutely without any control in one or the other parameter. So they were not able to achieve any of the controls. When we look to individual data, for looking to the HP1C, we see that it was more in control in the elderly population, but only 24%, which was very, very alarmingly less as compared to the ICMR data. And it was matching the data in the middle-aged population, and it was very less controlled in the young population. Only 16% had only HP1C as one parameter which was under control. Similarly, the LDL cholesterol was only 34% which was under control and LDL is a marker for cardiovascular disease, for, for atherosclerotic plaque to develop and to develop coronary vessel disease or myocardial disease because diabetic patients are very susceptible to have initially starting with diastolic dysfunction landing up to systolic dysfunction because the myocardium gets affected with this LDL cholesterol which is more, more difficult to manage. Among all this, what we have seen was that only 44% of the population had two parameters under control, that the A1C and the blood pressure. And however, the, the, when we compared this to various other studies which was conducted in the country, it was coming out to be at par with Kumar et al. and other studies where the HB1C target was only 3.5% which was under control. A total 34.8% of the population did not have a single ABC goal under control, neither the blood pressure, nor the sugar, and nor the LDL cholesterol. And this was the finding which was consistent with the data from all across the 14 centers. It was almost the similar data all across the country. And this mandates a more intensive, like ma'am said, that there has to be a road map, there has to be a map for the people who are like us to, to treat these type of patients. So I'll, I'll just conclude because the diabetic patients, they are under the regular clinical care. They come to us regularly every three months. They have their HbA1c levels with us. We have to check their blood pressure and we look to the lipid profile. Now, we are somewhere ignoring the LDL part or we are ignoring the blood pressure part. Ambulatory blood pressure is taking out hidden blood pressure patients in our, in our population. We are using a lot of ambulatory BP machines also to find out who is a hidden type of a person who has got blood pressure. So these parameters, if we control now, the burden of disease in the future will be less. The coronary events will be less. Post-COVID, we are seeing lots and lots of young adults having coronary artery disease. Post-COVID, this one of my paper has been published in the uh, ACB, where we have detected more young diabetic patients who have happened to be post-COVID. So this is also one thing which has been to consider. Uh, the LDL uh, cholesterol under control in overall diabetic population has been very, very low. So that the target should be LDL, not only the cholesterol part. Achievement should be, and, and it as we have seen that it increases with age. That means the elderly are more conscious the young adults are less conscious, maybe because of their lifestyle, maybe because of their ignorance, maybe because of their busy schedules. So this is where we need to intervene. Poor diabetes control, lack of awareness, more, more conservative attitude. We need to ad administer a three-dimensional strategy so that we not only the blood pressure or glycemic control, but also the lipids are to be under control. A focus finding and policy makers need to understand these things. These are all the references and this was the data which was uh, presented. Thank you. Thank you all for the rest.
How does this thing move? Where do the slides go? <laughs> oh, shut up. <laughs> okay, and we move with this here. Okay, all right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot, Prabhjot. And, um, I've been told to stick to 10 minutes. That doesn't count because we've not started yet. Um, it's slightly different from what we've been hearing uh, since morning is um, what we're talking about how, what the kind of work that you guys have been doing all over the world and over the years. Um, we're trying to talk about um, what we have tried to build here at, at CMC Ludhiana and um, across India and, and now across many of the um, countries in what we call the Global South. So I'm going to talk a little bit about global surgery research. I'm a pediatric surgeon and a pediatric urologist by trade, so it is slightly out of my domain area, but this is something that I've got involved in the past uh, five to six years. All right, he wants the mic shorter. Okay. Um, this way. No? All right. So just to give you a perspective and a background about surgery, um, uh, we've got numbers here about communicable diseases and for a long time uh, health infrastructure and health authorities in India concentrated on mortalities in communicable diseases and it's re recently that we've moved on to NCDs uh, in India. Um, the lack of surgical care or complications from surgery actually account for more deaths in India and low middle income countries than HIV, malaria and tuberculosis combined, which is a stark statistic that came out of the, the Lancet Commission report in 2015-16 um, over things that happened in the global south. Um, about 313 million surgeries happen annually around uh, low and middle income countries and this has numbers increased now after COVID because of the backlog that COVID morbidity or mortality waiting for care. And those who can get care in India especially, 25% of those will have a catastrophic financial exp uh, expenditure which will uh, basically make them uh, repay loans throughout the rest of their lives. So surgery, as I put it, in surgery and global health is the neglected stepchild of global health and anesthesia, the invisible friend of global health. And I don't look at surgery as surgery alone. It is a team where surgical surgeons, anesthetists, surgical nurses, everybody. Um, and surgical nurses are, are the Cinderella's. They're very important. While we're operating, once we're finished, we do not bother about them and how they are going to uh, upskill themselves, how do we train them, we don't really bother about them anymore. So that's how it is, and that is a story of surgery um, over the years um, in many of our countries. Um, research and surgery is critical because there's a lot more surgery that needs to be done, and we are at a risk of overstretching what our resources are. So we need to do research to provide care without overstretching. And also there are benefits of surgical research where we assure quality care. It's very important to in 2024 to assure good quality surgical care where patient safety is paramount and also create future surgical leaders uh, across the world. Uh, and that's where collaborative research comes in. That's very important. Once upon a time, we used to do single institution research, but that is probably passe now, and where collaborative research is very important, but there you get different ideas and different uh, views of what you're going to do. Um, I'm not going to go into details of collaborative research because that's what happened with us here at Ludhiana and the University of Birmingham. When we started getting involved with collaborative research with the NIHR or the National Institute of Health Research in the UK and the University of Birmingham to start what is known as the Global Health Research Unit on Global Surgery. Um, 
the agenda or the mandate was priority setting. What are priority areas for us in surgical research? Information gathering, good information, real information, and honest information. Um, evidence generation, what you can do, and evidence which has health economics as its background, so that's not a costly intervention. There's no point in putting robots all over the place in the global south. It's not going to help anybody, which we still do in many of our hospitals where we put in robots, uh, which make, just makes things expensive. Um, sustaining our research modules, our training, etc., and training the uh, surgical research of uh, researchers of tomorrow. And so that, that slide is a bit blind. So we started this research where we opened um, hubs across three continents in South and Central America, in Africa, and in Asia. And in Asia, the largest hub, or in fact, the largest hub across uh, across our uh, our research collaborative, is in India is in Ludhiana and is led by CMC Ludhiana, something that all of us should be fairly proud of uh, on what we have done and achieved here. Um, India is the largest hub in the network. As I said, when we started in 2017, 18, we had five hospitals in India in this network. We are over 100 hospitals will work together to provide data, surgical research, innovations, etc. And these hospitals include large medical schools, um, training institutes like the PGI, All India Institute, but also, very importantly, rural hospitals and mission hospitals across India where data never came out because they were too busy, they didn't have research uh, associates, they didn't have research infrastructure, and that's what we uh, looked at, at provide, providing research infrastructure, not in just teaching hospitals or big hospitals, but also in mission hospitals and rural hospitals, getting the real data. And 60% of our population, whatever we say, still lives in our villages. And if we don't give them the answers and get the data out from them, there's no point in us doing research. So we built a hub there in, in CMC Ludhiana. This is an old picture from 2018 where we started our hub and then we built a collaborative uh, across India. We are now present in almost all states of India um, and our team, some of whom are here, sat through uh, days and days of teaching people in mission hospitals, in medical schools, in large teaching hospitals, in large private hospitals on what we are going to do in terms of research, emphasizing the need for honest data, emphasizing the need for absolutely being collaborative, emphasizing the need that there is no vertical structure. We work on a horizontal structure of leadership. There is no senior and junior. I am not the boss. Most of my team do scold me most of the times. And so that's what we worked on, that we are working as equals. And when we be equals, we don't work as equals as surgeons, but equals as surgeons, anesthetists, nurses, research associates, research nurses, everybody. And more importantly, working with patients and our communities to develop uh, surgical research in India and the Global South. Um, since then, we've done a whole load of article uh, projects, both uh, cohort studies, randomized control trials, cluster randomized control trials, TEPFETCH cluster randomized, so different types of trials that have been conducted across the world. And India has led some of those trials uh, with great distinction. And I'm very proud of my team, which is sitting here, which, have, which has done this humongous work across the country and across the world. Um, I won't go through all of them. Cheetah trial is for the largest cluster randomized trial in surgery ever. And out of that, the largest proportion of, uh, the largest contribution was from India and was led from CMC Ludhiana. So again, huge kudos to people who in this department, in the surgical department here in, in CMC Ludhiana who have done it. And, um, and, and, and then we moved on to what is continuing now is one of the largest anesthesia trials, so known as a penguin trial, again led by anesthetists here in CMC Ludhiana, where we are looking at uh, different fractions of oxygen um, uh, to see whether that decreases surgical site infection rates um, in our patients. To sustain research, you need to train people, and we train people. We opened a data center, which is in the health sciences block now, where we train data managers, uh, research associates, etc., where we will generate employability in the, uh, as well as getting the skills to enter, get information properly. And so this data center, which is now funded by the University of Edinburgh with about 25 workstations, and where we work on both data management, statistical training, data analysis training, etc. Um, we developed this further, we moved beyond surgery and anesthesia, so th our teams are very diverse. We have pharmacologists, we have microbiologists, we have biochemists, we have, uh, we have people from every speciality in, in, our, in our hospitals. 
and we have a large education center. And one of the things that we have started doing here in India is that we have started leading training in qualitative research. It is the words and the voices behind the numbers. The numbers are important, but the voices behind those numbers are as important. And you can see Gagan, um, Gagan, uh, Gagan is, uh, is one of our juniors who has led this, um, um, led this education and training center here in India. Um, unfortunately, Gagan has moved on to another institution, but she continues to lead that. So our alumni are actually contributing huge amount in sustaining surgical research, and they need not be surgeons. She's a pharmacologist and a medical educationist by profession, but she's done a wonderful job um, in what we do know as a GSU education center. We also thought rural surgery is very different. I'm sitting in here in Ludhiana and Delhi. It's no, I'm, it's no point that I can understand what's happening in rural India. So now we have another rural surgery hub which works independently. I don't know if any of you remember uh, this gentleman. He's called Philip Alexander. He works in the Manali Mission Hospital and he leads the rural surgery uh, research network. And the big thing that we've started recently is what we call community engagement initiatives. So we look at, go to the communities, talk to the people there and what they want in research, what are their concerns about surgery. And the, since the last, I think, five months or so, uh, about 5,000 kilometers across India and um, in Punjab and Tamil Nadu and uh, Bengal have been covered to try and work with communities. Um, our community engagement initiative has been recognized by the government of Punjab and now we are tasked by training, um, uh, tasked to train ASHA workers or community health workers across Punjab in surgical wound management, taking care of surgical site infections for stoma care. And this is something that we've started and I think we have already, already covered more than 700 ASHA workers in our first phase of our, of our work. And like I said, the nurses were very important. Sangeeta, I don't know if she's not here right now, Dr. Sister Sangeeta Samuel leads the surgical nursing network across the world. She is one of our nurses here in, in, in Ludhiana and they are working on training nurses in providing better surgical care in the operating room. And along with that, we've started doing quality improvement, use, uh, working with the Lifebox Foundation in the UK to do QI work in the operating rooms where we instill checklists, et cetera, so we make less mistakes and we have better care. Um, environment sustainability is extremely important. It's a big topic now. We are in a, uh, in a, in a time of our, of our lives where if we don't work on environment sustainability, we will be in trouble very soon and we will leave a worse world for our future generations. So we're looking at environment sustainability in surgery. In a hospital, the most polluting part of the hospital is the operating room. Um, in terms of disposables, in terms of anesthetic gases used, especially in low and middle income countries, we use a lot of halothin, et cetera, and we are trying to do research to see how we can reduce the carbon and water footprint in our operating rooms. Hopefully in the next few months, Global Surgery will be able to fund our operating rooms to become completely solar. Um, and then the Wellcome Trust from the UK came along and uh, started work with us on the Leap Safe project, which is basically simulation training in surgery, where we use gaming technology, we use tissue-based work, we also are looking at improving and developing wireless monitoring systems for our post-operative patients. Um, we are looking at virtual reality in training, and this is something that we have started doing recently for our medical students. When I became a surgeon, surgery was the, the specialty to go for. It is not anymore. It is right at the bottom of the brain. So what we are trying to is target uh, medical students, interns, etc., to get them more interested in surgery and so improve the surgical pool, because if we don't do that, we will have less surgeons. 50% of them will go to the UK or Australia or to the US and we will be left with very few surgeons in the future. Um, sorry. I died. Can I have the next slide? Uh, yeah. No, go back. I'm just finished. Go back, 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 back. Back. And so, um, so our work has been recognized now and what we've, we've just found, got a grant from the Duke Foundation of the Duke University to work on developing SOTA care dashboards across, uh, across India and this is something that's going to happen. 
And two days ago, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, representatives were here. We are starting a program on device development with the Gates Foundation and a company called Sybil from Chicago, um, where we will develop wireless devices uh, for post-operative care, um, which are AI-based, which will decrease documentation for nurses. And again, this program itself is going to be led by our surgical nurses and not so much by our, our, our surgeons. Because the work has expanded, we have opened sub-hubs in, in TMC Velo, um, TMC Kolkata, and the last one will be at Ames Jodhpur. This is being led by CMC Ludhiana, something that all of us as alumni should be very proud of, that we are now leading work in many of these very prestigious institutions across, across the country. Um, I would be amiss uh, if I did not mention the name of these two gentlemen, Parvez Haq, who's the head of surgery right now, and Atul Surai, who's our hub manager. Um, I think a large part of the success of global surgery in India is because of these two guys, because they have worked day in and day out, and my team, which is sitting, sitting right there, um, who have worked tirelessly over the years. This is our fifth year. We are funded till 2030. That's when I will be retiring. Um, and I think we've, 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 we're just expanding so exponentially, it becomes difficult sometimes to take care of this. But thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions if you want to. Yeah, that's right.
बिल्डिंग में इतनी तेज कि लोगों की बुराई के धागे आपके पैरों में ही अटक कर टूट जाए टाइम टू वन फास्ट वन टू अचीव योर गोल्स यू ऑलरेडी कम्प्लीटेड वन माइल स्टोन एंड लॉन्ग वे टू गो parents faculty and staff well wishes friends from the media ladies and gentlemen on behalf of the christian medical college and hospital ludhiana i dr rinchi mumba proudly take the privilege of warm of warmly welcoming you all to the annual convocation 2024 of christian medical college ludhiana the second oldest medical college in asia with a legacy of 130 years being consistently ranked amongst the top colleges of the country christian medical college and hospital looks on looks on with pride at its latest crop of healthcare professionals who join the thousands before them in the service of humanity in a multitude of countries in all the continents recording we are members of the cmc of humana family minute ke andar camera recording wala yahan pe recording aani hai card pe reh gaya 13 minute da 13 minute da 
of all the occasions in our incredibly packed and busy year, Convocation Day is the most important and the most joyous because it's the day when not only you, our graduates and post graduates, but also the faculty, staff, alumni, and friends of the college can truly congratulate ourselves on a job well done. Before we proceed further, may I request you all to put your mobiles either on silent mode or switch them all, switch them off altogether. Silent mode allows. So that the program goes on uninterrupted. So we begin our program and we begin with an invocation song. अपना ट्राई बोल लेंगे तो क्या? तो अच्छे का ट्राई बोलेंगे। तो आये वो स्टैंडर्ड आदि स्टेज लांगी थी वे। 